All right, th this is interesting. Apparently, the interwebs don't want me playing the Alex Jones was right video. Hold on one second. We need to not have the confrontation with the police. They're going to make that the story. I'm going to march to the other side where we have a stage where we can speak and occupy peacefully. Tell everybody behind you, march to the other side. March to the other side. Hold on one second. I hear a video somewhere in the background. Give me one second to find the video that's playing music. Oh, jeez, Louise. Okay, so now I don't hear the video playing. Oh, there was a video playing in the backdrop. You can't see it, but I can hear something extra going on in my head. First of all, Good afternoon. Happy New Year. I, I hear myself playing in the background. Where is it? No, nobody can fully understand how annoying this is. I've left one window open, and I know what it is. It's the original, hold on, episode 192. Here we go. There, I found it. Okay. Now, back to the beginning. Good afternoon. Uh, Happy New Year for those who have not tuned in for any Viva Fry streams since we've uh, entered a 2024. Karen, I'm feeling better. I had a week of antibiotics, which wreaks havoc, as my wife says, on the, what is it called? The, uh, the gut biome? I don't know what it is, whatever. It's, uh, I feel better. Still lingering, uh, a lingering sinus-ish, very minimal for those who don't know. Go back to Canada, get sick, get a sinus infection. I'm out for a week. I mean, I was struggling to get streams together, struggling to put out the vlogs, <clears throat> excuse me, so that I could stay uh, in touch with everyone that I love. Oh yeah, the gut biome, that's it. So now I have to eat a bunch of yogurt and probiotics and all this other crap. Um, okay, but nobody wants to hear about that TMI. Like you get old, all you talk about is your, your, your physical ailments. I'm sure everybody's very interested to know my sciatic is better. So now I, I, I went back to jogging on a treadmill for about a week or two weeks and I feel better. So maybe it's jogging on pavement, but now I'm back in Florida. So I'm going to have to go back to jogging on pavement. Regardless, happy new year. We have to start the show at four o'clock today uh, because this is not a humble flex and there's no but to this. I don't really want to go, but I've been told you can't say no to this particular football game, I was invited to the Dolphins versus the, uh, the Bills. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll send my, I'll, Marion can go, what, the kids can go. And they're like, no, you, you can't really turn down this football game. I've never been to an American football game in my entire life. I went to a, a CFL game. I mean, that, that I think is like comparing figure skating to NHL. Uh, not to be, <laughs> not to be too mean to the CFL. I went to see the Montreal Alouettes play at the McGill Stadium. And uh, was it the Montreal Alouettes or was it the McGill? Whatever. I've seen a Canadian football game. Someone said, Viva, I got, I got two extra tickets. You got to come. And I was like, I got the show. I don't really want to go. I don't like crowds. And I don't really, I mean, I don't really like football. I haven't watched it in a long time. I was told that it's not a game that anybody can turn down. So I'm going to the football game. At, uh, I think it starts at 8.20 tonight, which is very late. And I don't like late night nights, but whatever, I'm going to go. So that's why I have to do the show a little early. <sighs> um, we'll get to the sponsor in a second. I want to do like a, a bit of a special intro because yesterday was January 6th. It was Happy Insurrection Day. And 
for people who spend too much time on Twitter, that would include me and I can fully recognize that. I find it useful to know what the enemy is saying. And if you were on Twitter on Insurrection Day, January 6th, the three year anniversary of the day that will live in infamy, what you saw on Twitter is a tale of two cities, a tale of two worlds, one screen, two films. It was some of the most enraging rubbish you could ever possibly imagine. Propaganda, up the wazoo, Tristan Snell, Hakeem Jeffries, everybody coming out. It was the darkest day. We must remember this solemn day forever. In hindsight, once you understand what a setup, what an inside job January 6th was, it becomes impossible to just watch and look at the rubbish on Twitter without feeling the need to vociferously call out the bullshit which I think I did. And Ashley Babbitt murderer is still free. Oh, no, no, it's not murder because murder in law is the unlawful killing of a human. Uh, they investigated uh, Lieutenant Byrd and said it was totally lawful. We're gonna talk about Ashley, the estate of Ashley Babbitt's lawsuit against the government for wrongful death, etc. cetera. Uh, you read that lawsuit and it will enrage you because you know, one fact that I don't think many people appreciate highlighted in that lawsuit, Lieutenant Byrd was not in uniform. There were no warnings given before fatally shooting Ashley Babbitt. So what you have is basically a plain clothed assassin in a crowd firing into a crowded area with no warning, no instructions to stop doing what you're doing or face lethal consequences. Un, uh, what's not unclothed, plain clothed. It's, it's enraging. So we're going to do a bit of an intro. It'll be our, uh, the day after Insurrection Day special because I didn't listen to Joe Biden's full speech. I cannot and I will not. I got the highlights. I got as much of the highlights as I need to get. I, I want to play you some of the highlights. And then we're going to have a laugh. Listen, listen to highlight number one. Listen to this. Just understand what he said here. This, this man is demented. The man is senile. The man has dementia, Alzheimer's, some cognitive impairment. Anybody who's ever seen the face of someone suffering from it knows what that face looks like. It looks like this. Listen to this highlight. God bless you all and may God protect our troops. God bless you all may God protect our troops. Yep, where am I going? God bless you all and may God protect you. Where was the one where he said democracy? Look at this lost, demented. What in the name of sweet holy hell is that about? You, you imagine, like, other than the fact, it's scary on its face. He understands power, and we're going to see in a second, he really does understand power. Sitting there boasting about the fact that they locked up, got convictions or plea deals from 900 protesters. They locked them up for over 840 years. We'll get there. He's a lost, dawdling old, old demented man. A woman comes in, he hugs his wife, and then immediately turns to the mic and says, I understand power. Holy hell, people. That, um, that, that is certainly indicative of some wiring of a brain that looks at women and immediately thinks power on the one hand. And even if it were just him flexing, say, I understand power. Oh, he understands power. Listen to this. This is from Charlie Kirk. One desperate act available to him. 
the violence of January the 6th. And since that day, more than 1,200 people have been charged for their assault on the Capitol, nearly 900 of them. For, for those of you who can't understand his slurring, demented speech, over, over 1,200 were charged for the assault on the Capitol. Have been charged for their assault on the Capitol. Nearly 900 of them have been convicted or pled guilty. 900. Collectively to date, they have been sentenced to more than 840 years in prison. Have been sentenced to more than... Collectively to date, they have been sentenced to more than 840 years in prison. He's bragging about this. Date. They have been sentenced to more than 840 years in prison. I, I've got to, look, at this, look at this, look at this demented face. Can I zoom in? I can't. This is the face of someone who has no idea what he's doing, where he is, what's going on, what year it is. Huh? Oh, but, but, but the crowd is cheering. This is the left, people. This is criminal justice reform left. This is freedom of speech left. This is a racist patriarchal uh, justice system left. Celebrating over 840 years in prison for the January 6th protesters. And they clap. Well done. This is the same animal that calls Putin a tyrant, that calls Putin an autocrat, dictator, for locking up journalists, for locking up dissidents. This man sat there and boasted to America that he, I mean, it's an interesting thing that he's sitting here boasting about the fact that they got 840 years up prison for protesters. He's supposed to have nothing to do with the justice system. It's supposed to be a system that works totally independently, yet he seems to be taking credit for the convictions, for the plea deals, for the persecutions. Boasting about the fact that they've locked up protesters for 840 man years. It, it, I, I was sitting there this morning like, it's, it's enraging. It's enraging, but it's, it's mostly depressing. And, I, and I'm not saying this to be melodramatic or hyperbolic. It's sad. Not just that this demented fool, this demented tyrant is sitting here burning the system down. You go on Twitter and there's people who I know are real people cheering it on. There are people out there who say, yeah, it's good. Lock them up. Oh, what's that? Uh, you know, the, the system is racist and, and locks up black people. We need, to have, uh, we need to have judicial reform, criminal justice reform, bail, non, no, no cash bail. Let people, the same people who say this are the same hypocrites who justify two years of pretrial detention torture. The same hypocrites who say that are the ones who are cheering on 840 years for protesters. Whether or not you consider them violent protesters, whether or not you agree with what they did. Goddamned hypocrites. There's no other way to say it. And there's a lot of them out there. And there's a lot of them because they're listening to people like this. Listen, listen to this. I forget the guy's name. You'll, you'll, you'll see it in a second. This, there's people out there who listen to this news, get this for their news, and it's just... Hitlerian level, Goebbels level propaganda, Stalin level Pravda propaganda. Listen to this. Former DC Metropolitan Police Officer Michael Fanon was there that day, there on the west front of the Capitol battling the mob. He was dragged down the Capitol steps. He was tased by someone in the pro-Trump mob. He suffered a heart attack during the fighting. And in a detail that crystallizes the horror that unfolded on January 6th, Fanon recalls insurrectionists shouting, quote, kill him with his own gun. Despite having lived through that harrowing assault and living with the consequences of that trauma, Fanon has not stopped defending our democracy. He has sought to hold those responsible accountable, and he has an urgent message for the urgent. American people as later. the 2024 urgent. presidential campaign season gets underway. Fanon told HuffPost, quote, Ultimately, you, the American voter, will be the last line of defense when it comes to preserving democracy as we know it and ensuring the peaceful transfer of power. And it's that serious. Joining me now in studio is Michael Fanon, former D.C. Metropolitan Police Officer, 
Courage for America Council member and author of Hold the Line, The Insurrection and One Cop's Battle for America's Soul. Officer Fanon, I'm going to try to get through this. Oh, 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 um, oh God, oh God. Uh, thank you oh, oh, for what thank, you did oh. three years ago today. I mean, th this guy looks like he can't believe the, 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 what he's looking at himself. Um, please tell me please. your thoughts we're, we're um, watch on this, this third anniversary. And over Hold the line, and over the insurrection, again. and one cop's battle he's got his for Kleenex America's in his soul. He's got a Kleenex Officer in his Fanon, hands. I'm going to try to get through this. Um, Officer Fanon, I'm going to try to get through this. Officer Fanon, I'm going to try to get through this. Um, uh, uh, thank you uh, oh for what you did three years ago today. Uh, uh, um, please you, tell me please, your uh, thoughts now I'm done. Now I'm um, done. on this third anniversary. Now I'm done. I mean, holy cow. Can it get any worse than that? Officer Fanon. I'm going to try to get through this. Here's the tweet. First of all, I'll tell you one thing. If you're that fragile of a human, get the hell out of journalism. You have no business being in journalism if that is the type of stuff that brings you to tears on air. Get the hell out of journalism, whoever that guy was, I forget his name, incompetent, uh, fragile, weak, and unfit for the profession. That's assuming it's sincere. That is as about as sincere as saccharine. That's about as natural as crystal meth. It, disgusting display of shameless propaganda is what that is. Um, uh, oh, crying over January 6th. Oh my goodness, man. S send, send him to Gaza. S have him report there. I mean, he, he, he won't be able to get a sentence out of his mouth. Send him to, send him to, to Ukraine. Send him to a conflict zone. S you know, hey, send him to the southern border. Hell, send him to anywhere in America where hundreds of thousands of people are dying from fentanyl overdose. Oh, will he cry then? No, he won't. Because it's not part of the bloody agenda. This is about 2024 election interference, and we're seeing the groundwork for it now. Okay, I see Barnes in the backdrop. But, Robert, before I bring you in, you may have noticed, in fact, you should have, when you came into the stream that it said, this stream contains a paid promotion. Because it does, people. It's the new year. Okay, new year is not just about making resolutions that you will not keep. Keep your resolutions realistic, keep them proportionate, and keep them attainable so that you don't let yourself down by setting unrealistic, unattainable objectives as a New Year's resolution. The easiest one to make and keep, be healthy. Cut out the bad habits, add in some exercise, add in some sunlight, all the regular stuff. Eat healthy, get the bad habits out of your system, pun intended. Easiest way to do that? Fieldofgreens.com, people. Uh, pe desecrated powdered greens, Eat your fruits and vegetables. It's a little known fact. You're supposed to have five to seven servings of raw fruits and vegetables a day. Most people do not have that. And it's a bad habit to get it. They suck down a disgusting Diet Coke or a sugar-laden Red Bull. Don't do that. One spoonful twice a day will give you one serving of fruits and vegetables per spoonful twice a day. That's two spoons. Two servings of fruits and vegetables. All the antioxidant stuff. It's food. It's not an extract. It's not a supplement. It's USDA organic certified. Made in America. Tastes good. Twice a day, you cut out the bad habits, you add in a good habit, uh, and you treat your body like the temple that it is and not like the experimental testing grounds that our governments of the world have turned it into. Go to Viva, not Viva, what is, sorry, it's fieldofgreens.com. Promo code Viva, 15% off your first order. And what else do they got? So they got a bunch of flavors. They've got other products as well. Uh, but the easiest thing to do, get a good healthy habit. One spoonful twice a day, fieldofgreens.com. Promo code Viva and you're already off to a good New Year's. All right, I see Robert in the backdrop. I'm gonna bring him in now. Robert, sir, how goes the battle? Good, good. Long time no see. Now, hold on, I'm gonna go into the audio on YouTube and just make sure that our audio is aligned. No thanks, right. hold on one second, live. Okay, Robert, tell us what you did over the New Year's and I'll see if our audio's aligned. Uh, was in Chattanooga, Tennessee, my hometown. It's good. All right. What uh, may I ask? What, you, what was the weather like in, in Tennessee over winter? Is it is it cool or warm? It varies. And you had a good New Year's. Yep. Okay. Well, <laughs> Robert. I mean, it's one of our subjects of the of the uh, afternoon. I suspect you had a good New Year right up until uh, the raid on Amos Miller Farms. Oh my goodness. Okay. First of all, so, so tell us what's the book behind you? Are you smoking a cigar? And what's on the menu for the evening? 
Uh, the Devil's Empire, a book about the uh, French New Orleans, uh, French colonial New Orleans, uh, that uh, I'll be in New Orleans this week. On Wednesday morning, the uh, the they're going to have the oral argument in the Fifth Circuit there in the Federal Court of Appeals that uh, they're in the New Orleans courthouse uh, concerning children's health defense, whether there's a right to sue by them and other parents uh, concerning the FDA's authorization, approval, labeling, branding, and marketing of the COVID-19 vaccine and its boosters for young children. So our argument is that, uh, in fact, there is standing. There is a Article Three case or controversy uh, that the case should proceed and progress accordingly, and the case should be reinstated. And uh, so I'll be down there preparing for that and making the oral argument Wednesday morning. And that's just a book about New Orleans, which is kind of interesting during the, the pre-American stage of New Orleans when it was uh, uh, a French colony. The uh, And the cigar is uh, a gift of one of our great board members. It's uh, Pappy. Van Buren Cigars, uh, which is Pappy's, my favorite bourbon, great bourbon, 23-year Pappy's in particular. So uh, thanks to the board member who uh, sent those courtesy of uh, Christmas. And uh, that's about it. All right, awesome. And what do we have on the menu for tonight? So we're going to review the biggest cases of 2024. So we got Trump, Trump's criminal cases, Trump's civil cases, whether Trump will be on the ballot. We've got uh, the big cases up before the Supreme Court concerning big tech, concerning the Second Amendment, concerning January 6th. We've got uh, the Amos Miller case. We've got the vaccine-related cases, Brooke Jackson's case, CHD's children's health defense cases, the Tyson Foods and employer cases. We've got crypto and the Fed and the issues that may be implicated in financial freedom. So we got political freedom, food freedom, financial freedom, medical freedom, all uh, on the docket in 2024 got a couple of bonus cases about paralegals suing, claiming their First Amendment right to give legal advice. Uh, we got Cher uh, trying to become a conservator for her kid. And we've got uh, Biden suing Texas to stop them from enforcing the immigration laws that he's not enforcing. And New York suing to stop Texas from sending uh, 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 immigrants to New York City, which even though it's a sanctuary city and a sanctuary state decides they don't want to be the sanctuary place anymore. May I impose and can I add as the start off to the show, the Ashley Babbitt wrongful, the estate of Ashley Babbitt wrongful death lawsuit against the government? Yeah. Okay. And now just so everybody knows, we're going to end on YouTube. I guess we'll do this in a, maybe one or two more uh, subjects. Then we're going to end on YouTube. Go over to Viva Fry on Rumble or vivabarneslaw.locals.com on Locals because we're going to get off of the commie tube and go over to the free speech platform. Robert, okay, so the, the, the big news, we talked about it extensively back in the day. Uh, Ashley Babbitt, the estate of wrongful death lawsuit against the government, they had to exhaust whatever the administrative delays are for the government to either answer their claim or deny their claim. Apparently, it's been two years. The government did not respond to the claim, so it's a deemed, uh, what, a deemed refusal, and they filed lawsuit, the estate of and the husband for wrongful death. Um... I read through it. I mean, I went through the highlights. Some of the fact pattern is quite damning as far as I'm concerned in terms of uh, Officer Bird being plain clothed and therefore indiscernible to the crowd in any event. Um, they go through some of the factual elements as to whether or not Bird rightly or wrongly thought that he was defending Congress people, whether or not he rightly or wrongly thought that he was trapped in that corridor. In fact, he had an exit. In fact, the majority of Congress had already been evacuated from the building. So who the hell was he protecting? Uh, reckless uh, discharge of a firearm into a crowded area, which according to the lawsuit, you can't do regardless because you need to know who's behind you. You got to have a damn good reason for using lethal force. Um, what do you think the chances of success are on this lawsuit in terms of holding anybody accountable? Well, we'll see. I mean, under the Federal Tort Claims Act, wrongful death claims can be brought against federal officers. You do have to exhaust your administrative remedies first before you're allowed to file suit. Credit to Judicial Watch, which my understanding has taken over the prosecution of the suit, at least at some level. They've also used the Freedom of Information Act request. Judicial Watch so with Tom Fitton does great work in that capacity. That's how we found out about Hillary Clinton's emails, even existing, was through Judicial Watch's uh, uh, aggressive FOIA activity. Judicial Watch also does great uh, work on purging uh, illegal reg illegally registered voters uh, from the voter rolls in a bunch of states. They're doing important work there as well. So this is a, a, I'm glad that they are involved with the case on her behalf and, the, and on her estate. To me, it's a classic case of wrongful death. 
I mean, that you, you, no one can tell me that that is self-defense. There, there's no way that's self-defense. To, 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 to shoot a, a person who is not presenting an imminent risk of severe bodily harm uh, without notice and just shoot him dead. Uh, to me, it's a classic wrongful death case. As the suit details, this officer has a history of misfiring his weapon and, and, and mishandling these circumstances and situations. It was a summary execution uh, by the Capitol Police, and there should be legal consequence. The question is whether the courts in the District of Columbia either the judges or juries will ever give it or grant it. And I think it shows once again, the problem of a district of Columbia, even existing as a federal court system, it has exposed its political prejudice and partisan bias in such a way throughout all these January six cases, throughout all the Trump cases that they shouldn't exist. And if Congress has ever gets serious about judicial reform in America, then it can start by getting rid of the District of Columbia as a separate judicial jurisdiction. The, we watched uh, this weekend at the, at the board the film Judgment at Nuremberg. And who was on trial in the Judgment at Nuremberg? The judges. That's who was at trial. Uh, the judges just followed what the government told them to do. So they sterilized people against their will. They sent people to the concentration camps. They sent them to be executed on bogus grounds. As the you know film finishes, he explains to the judge, uh, the German judge, you're you're absolutely guilty. You knew as soon as you executed one innocent man that you put us on the path to what happened in the Holocaust. And so it's the same. You know the the judges need to be put more on trial. And one way to do that is to get rid of the District of Columbia as a branch because this is a straightforward case that in any other instance, if the politics were flipped, uh, if the racial dynamics were flipped goes a white cop and a black victim, there's no doubt the media would be outraged and the courts would enforce justice. So if justice doesn't happen here, it's purely for prejudicial reasons that prove the incapacity of the judicial branch to be impartial in the District of Columbia. I, I, I hate doing the if the races were inverted, but it's so patently obvious. You get like armed black men who get shot and then they turn it into a racial, a racial issue. A black cop shoots a white woman point blank in his own testimony says, you know, I, I, I didn't know if she was a man or woman. I didn't know what she had in her hands. I didn't see anything. A point blank. It would be headline news forever. And it's, you know, at, at, at first it was just like the, the day it happened. I was like, you know, you, you do stupid things. You're asking for trouble, but not that much trouble. You know, it, it was dumb to be there. It was dumb to be smashing windows. You might be asking for trouble, like with the judicial system, not for summary execution. This is the guy, by the way, Lieutenant Byrd, once upon a time, left his firearm in a bathroom in the D.C. Uh, building, left it in the bathroom, he took it out to take a dump, left it on a counter. Just a very, very qualified officer. Um, <clears throat> the question that I was going to ask in terms of... Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, never mind. Okay. We'll see. Uh, Robert, hold on. Let me, let me do uh, three Super Chats because I forgot to do these. Viva, you can jog in the park while kick soccer ball. No, no, I'm, I'm watching the football game. I'm certain that, that was from uh, KM. Passion Moyer says, I'm certain that when Biden said he understood power, he meant that Jill has the power, not him. Oh, I didn't even think of it that way. When Jill came out, then Biden knew what he had to do. Okay, that's good. I still like my interpretation better. P.S. Never zoom in on Biden. All right. Uh, okay, let's do one of the Trump ones before we head over. Yeah, so the uh, Supreme Court has taken up the ballot case. There's uh, also the uh, uh, criminal cases that is pending before the D.C. Court of Appeals. The D.C. Court of Appeals agreed to former Attorney General Edwin Meese challenging whether Jack Smith even has any constitutional authority to do anything. Okay, hold on. Actually, let, let's stop it. We'll do that one, then we'll go over to the rest. So I covered that over the holidays, the amicus. This was before... Um... This was before the Supreme Court agreed to take it up, so I thought that amicus had... had... Oh, the, the Supreme Court did not agree to take that up. Ah, okay. And so that's back before the D.C. Court of Appeals, and so now the D.C. Court of Appeals agreed to add that to the pending appeal about presidential immunity. Does Jack Smith have legal power in the first place? Okay, uh, uh, only on the issue, that amicus, which was from Meese, which said that Jack was uh, Jack Smith, is citizen Jack Smith, was never lawfully appointed, um, cannot, cannot be appointed to that position bypassing all of the congressional hearings, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, everything he's ever done in the context of this persecution prosecution has been invalid. Let's just say, Robert, I mean, I, it's, I think it's totally unrealistic to even think that even if they come to that conclusion, they're going to strike down everything he did. 
would they have a, an administrative way of saying, all right, we'll replace someone who's going to retroactively ratify all of the acts of Jack Smith? They can't, no. Now, it wouldn't prevent them from another prosecutor separately bringing an indictment, but it, the, the current indictments would have to be dismissed. Hmm. Well, shut my big mouth then. <laughs> all right, we're 30 minutes in, Robert. Let's go on over to Rumble, where we're going to continue with the rest of this. Hold on just one second, everybody. I think the link should be pinned, but link to Rumble here, and I'll give everyone the link to Locals as well. If anybody wants to come over there, come on over to Locals. I will, I will get to the, um, hold on one second. I will get to the Rumble Rants over on Locals. Now, everybody's got the links to vivabarneslaw.locals.com and Rumble, and now we're going to end on YouTube because they don't deserve this. Peace, people. Come on over. Okay. All right, Robert. So, the, so w w which one did the Supreme Court say they're going to take? The ballot. Okay. Uh, what's, the, what's the time frame? They've got to start moving their butts on this. Uh, yeah, they've already expedited it. So there's briefing that's going to be wrapped up with oral argument by February. Uh, okay. I mean, I know the questions of law here now as to whether or not states have the willy-nilly power to self-execute the 14th Amendment third paragraph. Um, I guess maybe if there's more to the legal question, let me know. But Robert, what's your prediction as to what the Supreme Court is going to uh, rule here? I think they've been put in a position where they have no choice but to uh, hopefully make a very broad ruling that states don't have this power, period. That this is not, that the access to the ballot is limited by the Constitution, which only for the presidency concerns age, concerns natural born citizenship, and concerns length of residency. That's it. Uh, secondly, that the enforcement mechanism, even for those provisions, what the court should rule, is exclusively the prerogative of Congress. It is not the prerogative of anyone else. They try to challenge John McCain on grounds he shouldn't run because he was born in Panama. They tried to challenge uh, Barack Obama on the grounds he shouldn't be on the ballot, on the grounds he, the allegation was he was born outside the United States. The, uh, in, in those cases, the court said, this is none of the state's business. This is none of the court's business. This is Congress's business, whether or not a person is qualified or not and that there's a remedy in place constitutionally for Congress to execute in case that occurs. If someone is actually chosen to be the president who doesn't constitutionally qualify, the whole provision going back to FDR, the 25th Amendment is there, in, in ways that the vice president, uh, or and you go down the successive chain, whoever qualified, it would be put in until that person is qualified if there's some durational limitation. But this is solely and exclusively in the power of Congress, and that's what they should enforce. And that would put an end to this altogether. No more challenges to people getting on the ballot based on purported qualifications. They should also reinforce the right of the voters to choose uh, and expand that law and, and expand that ballot access in general. The states come up with every excuse known to man to try to keep somebody off the ballot. Three different states, including Maine and some others, are currently trying to prevent Robert Kennedy from even getting his petitions to be on the ballot. So the uh, this was after he had to sue in Utah to make sure he could have the opportunity to be on the ballot because they had a ridiculously early deadline. So they should broadly expand that this is the right of the people to choose uh, once the state gives them that right. And if, if a state determines, if a state wants to say the state legislature determines, fine. But once a state says, you, the people, get to choose who's president, that should end it. I mean, this was the, the only this was the only good part of Bush v. Gore, in my opinion, was they said, once you give the power to the people, that's it. And you can't try to take it back from them later. And so uh, that should and you have to enforce the rules fairly and equally. Uh, it was an equal protection claim in Bush v. Gore. They should extend that as well to the ballot access. I don't think they'll go that far because they don't have to to resolve this case, but I would like them to. But I don't think they have any choice but to say this is not within the power. Now, they have other alternative paths to that outcome. They could also say that the 14th Amendment simply doesn't apply to the president, as even the liberal district court and other courts have recognized across the country. The 14th, the insurrection clause has no application to the presidency. It's quite frankly, quite obvious if you just read the plain text of it. But they could go further. They could also establish that the insurrection clause is only enforceable by Congress as well, and that it, it at a minimum, it requires a 
judicial finding of, of, of guilt of insurrection. They could go further. They could say the fact that the president has already been acquitted on this charge under the impeachment clause also prohibits the efforts of the states to try to remove him from the ballot on these grounds. And then last but not least, they could simply state that uh, the, the, uh, in terms of state power in this arena, that they violated Trump's due process rights and how they went about this. I mean, it was mass hearsay introduced. I mean, it, it's the most hey, basically the cha- they broke evidentiary rules, process rules, constitutional rules. They broke all the rules just to keep Trump off the ballot. And credit to the people who pointed out in this all Democratic court, all the Democrats who went to the Ivy Leagues were the ones to kick Trump off the ballot. The ones who didn't go to the Ivy Leagues were the ones saying this is not a good idea. But, 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 well, we're going to go step by step on this. The first thing is just to clarify, because I, it even confuses me sometimes. In the Colorado case, in the uh, Maine case, they were talking about not including or disqualifying Trump from the primary versus the general. What, what is, are, what, are there any legal distinctions between exclusion from the primary versus exclusion from the general? Not the legal principles applied. So it, it is correct that right now he's not even on a general ballot yet because he isn't the nominee yet. But if the court upheld what the Colorado court did, then he will be excluded from the general election ballot okay. in a bunch of states. So, I mean, that, that's the practical reality of it. So th- this isn't about the primary because the, uh, the Republican Party can just change and do a caucus or just ignore the outcomes of the Colorado vote and change its rules to give Trump those uh, electors. Right? So, they, so or nominate Trump independently of that. So it really it has no impact on the primary. This is solely designed to establish a precedent to keep Trump off the general election ballot when he's the Republican Party nominee, as is almost a guarantee at this stage. Okay, excellent. That's the first question. Second question, we're going to go back to the main Secretary of State decision. In all her wisdom, uh, addressed Trump's arguments as relates to Article 14, subparagraph 3, not relating, not applying to the president, the office of the presidency or the vice presidency, because as Trump's counsel uh, submitted to the court, earlier drafts of, the, of that provision of the Constitution included the, the office of the vice president and the office of the president, and then they removed it from the final version. For most people, that would say they intended not to include it. According to the Secretary of State, she says, no, that, intent, that, that implies, suggests that they intended to, for it to have a broader application and that the office of the vice presidency and the presidency are offices under that paragraph. Um, can you, I don't know, can you, can you make those? That's... It's a patently frivolous argument. It's a patently frivolous argument. This has been determined many times by the courts that when there's general reference to officers, that does not include the president. They've said this over and over and over again in a wide range of contexts. That ends the question. That ends the issue, period. So the, uh, the, the fact that they specifically originally included and took it out just, you know, puts a nail in it, uh, in the coffin. So th- this is someone that's just making up claims directly contradicting plain law, who, by the way, would rever- who would rule just the opposite if it was her Democratic allies that were being challenged. This is a partisan hack who shouldn't even be a secretary of state in, uh, in, the, in this country. Uh, that she was appointed by the state legislature uh, incompetently by the main state legislature uh, that you know, the busy violating people's rights in a wide range of ways these days up in Maine because the little commie Portland has taken over the state. The uh, but it's a it's a frivolous interpretation. It's just a frivolous interpretation. The uh, and so that's why I don't think the court has any choice. The Supreme Court has any choice. Uh, legally, there's only one outcome here uh, that ha- makes any sense. That is historically correct, textually correct. That is uh, consistent with our policies, consistent with our precedents. But just the politics of it. I mean, when you have people like Governor Newsom, when you have people like Bill Barr, you have people like that who are Trump haters saying this is a bad idea, then you get a sense that, uh, I mean, you, you couldn't even get all seven Democratic judges on the Colorado oh, Supreme the, Court. The three, the three dissidents had the most blistering dissidents. Uh, and Robert. they're all hardcore Democrats. They just, none of them went to the Ivy League. They, from now on, if you go to the Ivy League, you should be excluded from consideration from federal courts. <laughs> uh, that, that's, I mean, it, they're just too dangerous to put on there. They, this is, or state courts. Uh, And this is further proof of it. It's like the popular bumper sticker now. My kid did not go to Harvard is an achievement. Uh, Not that your kid did go to Harvard because of what an embarrassment these institutions have become and what they've promoted and promulgated through our systems of power and influence. 
Um, these are the same people who a century ago uh, were pushing eugenics, and proudly so. The uh, the the you know uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes of the world. Um, they've been wrong a lot more often than they've been right. Uh, but I think politically they don't have a choice either, uh, because otherwise you have complete chaos. Uh, you, you're going to have a bunch of conservative states say, "Okay, this is the new law." Biden's off the ballot. I mean, they'll be tit for tat. Um, all of a sudden, he's off the ballot in Florida. He's off the ballot in Texas. Mm-hmm. He's off the ballot who knows where else. So, I mean, the idea that that this can work, they know this is utterly unsustainable. It would make American democracy look like an utter joke, an embarrassment to the world. That's why the court has no choice. And don't be surprised if it's nine to nothing. The Democrats might write and take some pot shots at Trump, but don't be surprised if they join the ultimate conclusion that what Colorado did is not well-founded. Uh, and explain to those out there, I try to make sense of it. I think I've made sense of it. The self-executing argument of Article 14, subparagraph 3, that it needs no act of Congress. It needs no criminal charge, criminal conviction. It's self-executing, meaning anybody at any state level can willy-nilly declare insurrection and then exclude. It does, makes no sense at all. I mean, that, that, that by definition makes no sense. That would subject the presidential election to the whim of state officials. The, if, if, uh, why is it these same people said that the actual constitutional qualifications for the presidency, this is another problem. If, if their intention was to apply this to a, to a qualification of the presidency, there's specific constitutional provisions about what qualifications you have to have. The, they didn't add it to that. Why didn't they? Because they had no intention to apply it to the presidency. I mean, they, they were, and there was obvious reasons for it. There was no president to apply it to. This was solely to deal with the Confederacy, as Dershowitz has pointed out. This is a historical vestige that has no modern application. Until Trump, no one had ever attempted this particular kind of claim before. Uh, there was like one or two uh, one-offs in random cases over the years. It was just absurd to try to preposterous to try to claim this. Um, but the it, why wouldn't the uh, whether someone's been a resident for 14 years, why wouldn't that be self-executing? Whether somebody's a natural born citizen. Bunch of people don't believe Kamala Harris is. Can can they just start kicking her off the vice presidential ballot? Is it self-executing? I mean, self-executing is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. <laughs> so the uh, it, it makes no sense that we delegate certain tasks to certain bodies for a reason. And here, we don't have to question whether it's about Congress because the rest of the 14th Amendment talks about Congress being the one to create the laws to enforce it. So the idea that they had some doubts as to who was supposed to do this is removed by the plain text of the Constitution itself. People want sanctions against the judges, against the main secretary of state. Uh, don't hold their breath. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah that, they'll, they'll never do that. All right. What is the other one? What else is going up to SCOTUS? Uh, well, with Trump, with D.C. Court of Appeals has now two different issues that could resolve all of his criminal cases. One is the issue of presidential immunity, uh, because every claim, every criminal charge brought against him, you could argue about aspects of the Florida criminal charge, but all the rest uh, concerned things he did while he was president. And as such, presidential immunity historically has extended uh, to criminal prosecutions. I think that the ultimately Supreme Court can't have any confidence in the D.C. Court of Appeals. But I think the Supreme Court will ultimately rule presidential immunity applies for the same reason, for the very simple policy reason of are you going to subject the president to the extortionate whim of any local prosecutor anywhere really in the world? I mean, not just America. What about a country we have an extradition treaty with? Could they just decide they don't like somebody, indict him and extradite him? Could they threaten to do so while he's president and therefore extort public policy benefits to them for foreign governments? This is not ma- this is not manageable. And my view is there is a path like Jack Smith is saying, oh, this would be green light for Trump to go out and commit mass murder. The, the path is the impeachment clause that if you impeach a president or former president the, uh, and convict him, then that's the thing you can prosecute him for, which the Constitution clearly lays out that path. That should be the exclusive path, because if it's not then every president is subject to being extorted by any prosecutor in the world. And to flesh this out for those who may not understand, uh, Jack Smith's, uh, whatever the, 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 uh, his argument, not the fact, and whatever the heck, the submission to the court is that 
they frame it as Trump already committed a crime and therefore presidential immunity cannot uh, apply to crimes. The defense is saying, well, first of all, or the defense, Trump's team is saying, nobody's been convicted of anything yet. These are all sort of presumptively presidential acts. And the example everybody runs with is, hypothetically, Trump kills, up, you know, shoots a member of the cleaning staff in the Oval Office. Well, he doesn't benefit from presidential immunity to that. Robert, your, your argument, the retort to that is, he'll undoubtedly get um, impeached for that and, and likely convicted. And therefore, right. once that happens, then he can get prosecuted after right. he's no longer president. Correct. The one question those, is going to be... It's about who decides. I mean, that, that's what we're going to decide is, do we give the... I mean, the, 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 again, the Constitution lays out a nice, clean path for this. It says, here's how you deal with this situation. You impeach, you convict. And by the way, once there's a conviction, anybody can criminally prosecute. And by the way, he can't pardon himself for the impeachment, the, uh, uh, the, impeach, the impeachable offense. That's the path. Any other path diverts power because every question is who decides. This, uh, it shifts power to random prosecutors in the entire world. And that's the reason presidential immunity exists. It exists to prevent him being subject to the whim of an individual suit or an individual prosecutor anywhere in the world from being able to do his job as president. And again, if it's truly egregious what he is doing, there is a remedy. I mean, there's I mean, right now there's governments around the world that would indict every former president for war crimes. So, I mean, I mean, all of them, they line them up. Barack Obama can be prosecuted and be going to prison for life. George W. Bush, same thing. Bill Clinton, same thing. So, uh, you know, I mean, Jimmy Carter's still alive. He, he's one of the few people there isn't a lot of war crime charges against, but the rest there are. And uh, are we going to do that? I mean, well, what's I mean, if you don't grant, if you don't do the interpretation I'm talking about, you run that risk. And that's a much greater risk than the idea that the president's going to become a mass murderer who no one can do anything about. And so the some would say Joe Biden is already doing that in many respects. But the that, that's why immunity needs to be there. And in my view, the way you interpret it is you interpret the immunity in light of the impeachment clause. But some of the arguments that are being made are ludicrous. For it's saying, well, if it's a crime, it's not immunity. Well, I mean, I, we, that's, that, that's never been what the courts have said. The courts have said it's whether or not it's in the course of your duties not whether or not it's a crime or not, not whether or not it's a tort or not. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any immunity. There'd be no immunity from a criminal charge if, by definition, criminal accusations remove immunity. There'd be no immunity from a tort if, by definition, the allegations of a tort remove immunity. I mean, this precise claim has been addressed and rejected by every court to ever, ever adjudicate the matter. So you look at immunity, and the only way to have a preserve the presidency in its office is to grant it and to grant it extensively and expansively, letting the impeachment clause be the remedy for extreme circumstances and situations. Then the other thing is, I do think Mies is right. I don't think Jack Smith was lawfully appointed at all. The, well, look, before we get into the Jack Smith appointment, there, um, let's just say hypothetically, there is, take a less radical example, but let's just assume that the impeachment uh, process is so corrupted, so partisan, that even though you have a crime as apparent as drug dealing in the White House. Let's take that one. He gets impeached but not convicted. The argument's going to be, well, then he can't be prosecuted for drug dealing in the White House. Correct. That's absolutely right. Because and why? Because we, if, if it wasn't sufficiently persuasive that he was actually drug dealing or that it was consequential, then he would have been convicted. If he's not convicted, that means it's like any jury case. Right. In other words, the you could make the same claim for any jury trial case. Say, oh, the guy gets away with it if all 12 don't convict. Yeah, that's our system. So essentially, we're saying if it's truly an egregious crime that must be prosecuted, then you should be able to convince two thirds of the Senate. If you can't, that means it probably isn't. All right. Um, and I, I also would imagine that if it became as egregious as the president committed murder in the White House, but was acquitted by the impeachment, a country's broken at that point. On, 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 yeah, well, that's on my other point. Exactly. I mean, if, if you're in a situation where the, the system is so corrupt that they that the United your elected United States senators are covering for the criminal behavior of a president, you've got bigger problems uh, than than the uh, than the rest. 
And the question, again, is who do we give the power to? We're seeing now with Trump, if you give power to local prosecutors, it's a political disaster. Mm -hmm. It's a political nightmare. It's like the problem on the ballot. If you give it to a bunch of people that uh, a bunch of random state officials, local officials, you have a disaster on your hand. Um, so, you know, that that's where there's serious issues with trying to do that at any level. And it makes the ballot process an embarrassment, the American democracy an embarrassment, and our constitutional governance no longer constitutional governance. And that's really the other problem with Jack Smith. He's someone who's a who clearly is a rogue official who did not have the power to do any of this. And that also could remove all the federal cases that are pending. And is it likely someone else is going to step in and try to prosecute? Maybe. Uh, but there'll be all kinds of issues with it, how it's tainted by the illegal, unauthorized behaviors of Jack Smith. Well, Pete, we, we, I remember we talked about this at one point where we're basically saying like Jack Smith seems to be like Joe Biden's personally appointed henchman. Like his, his, his who, who does he answer to? Who is he acting for and on behalf of? The, Mises um, amicus. Mies was a former attorney general. I'm not wrong about this. Under yeah, That's correct. Yeah, under Reagan. Who, under Reagan. So the guy, guy knows what he's talking about. He says, at Merrick Garland had no authority to handpick a private citizen, not go through the ordinary process to appoint him to this special counsel position, which am I wrong in also remembering that it, the position doesn't exist under the law? Correct. I mean, what, what happened was the independent counsel statute was appointed post Nixon to try to resolve some of the issues that arose during the Nixon Watergate related issues. Uh, in terms of you know the Saturday Night Massacre and lots of people being fired at the Justice Department if they kept going towards uh, towards Nixon, et cetera, and the the by the by the end of the '90s, both parties were done with the independent counsel statute. They're like, this doesn't work. This creates a political nightmare. This in incentivizes dragging out cases. We're going to return to our constitutional system. Justices like Scalia never liked the independent counsel statute, and nor did I. I, I found it constitutionally abhorrent anyway um but once that and so then the question was well how do we have a special counsel now uh and so the only lawful way to do a special counsel is you appoint someone who has already been given prosecutorial power as an officer an existing, However, an existing attorney general of any what they could have picked from any of the states well, well not from the states it's from the feds uh so it could be the anybody that went through the process of becoming an officer which requires consent of the Senate. And, and so that's a, uh, the, the attorney general, the assistant uh, attorney general for tax, the deputy attorney general, and then each uh, United States attorney, the head United States attorney in each office. No one else has constitutional authority to execute their duties. The way I used to put this, because I've dealt with this in a range of contexts where somebody went rogue, is what prevents the local janitor who works in the federal, who's a federal employee, from walking into the grand jury a room and asking them, hey, will you please indict my ex-wife? What prevents that? Federal employee, right? Well, they're not given that constitutional authority. Only someone that is an officer can delegate it to someone else, and then the officer has to make the ultimate decision. Here, they couldn't, they didn't trust any of their own appointees. Not one of them, 425 U.S. Assistant United States Attorney, United States Attorneys in America. They didn't trust one of them to prosecute Trump. L so me, they me... went and got their hatchet, the deep state hatchet man involved with all kinds of corruption from these international criminal court days, as Patrick Byrne and others have been talking about, to do it. Problem was, that's not constitutional. That's not lawful. And if I may, just to clarify the one point, they could have selected from any one of their 425 existing members if they had done that though it would have had to have gone through congressional hearings or senatorial no because they, they're already congressionally appointed oh, the, those are people who are already officers they just uh, they clearly didn't trust any of their own appointed officers to do what they got jack smith to do and that's why they appointed him and the problem is that directly violates the law and it gives an easy opt-out for the supreme court for example to ultimately step in and did get dismiss all the charges so, you know, the, he, you can't do this. You have to go to the proper. And then, boom, all the federal Florida case out, D.C. case out. Then they have to go get one of their hacks to try to bring back up the case. But by that point, it's late. It's post-election. So uh, it's unlikely to occur. So the, uh, the I think they have identified two very serious issues uh, that 
could completely end the federal criminal prosecution and in the immunity context end the two state prosecution mm -hmm. as well. I was going to say, because th that would get rid of D.C., it would get rid of Florida, but not Georgia, New York, unless the immunity argument uh, is granted as well, in which case that would get rid of the state courts, the state cases. Um, but hold on. I want to come back to Jack Smith and the allegations of corruption. What country is it in, Robert? I forget what country he's alleged to be basically running an extortion ring out of. So it, this was for his days in the International Criminal Court. I recommend a film called The Whistleblower, which is really good about what was really going on in the Balkans. Uh, basically, you had human trafficking taking place under the guise of various U.N. activities and U.S. related and intelligence related operatives in the Balkans. Albania is a famous center for human trafficking for the better part of several decades, popularly portrayed in the film uh, Taken, uh, which has the great had maybe the greatest trailer of all time. I'm a man with a certain set of skills uh, that you don't want to test, as Liam Neeson said. The uh, basically he was neck deep in all that. So he was neck deep in a range of extortion related activities. If you want to avoid getting prosecuted at the ICC, you pay this person this much or you do this favor, or you do this. The ICC, the International Criminal Court is a racket. It shouldn't even exist. Uh, we generally have not recognized its jurisdiction, but, you know, it's a it's a useless court. Uh, and it's a court that is political, has always been political. Uh, they're just a political hatchet court to, pretending that they're the Nuremberg descendants when they're just the opposite in terms of that. They're more like the people who passed the Nuremberg laws than passed the Nuremberg code, uh, if you know what I mean. So the consequently, uh, it, it, but it doesn't surprise me. He's been a hatchet man his whole life, deep state hatchet man his whole life. He's a front guy. He's not smart enough to do his own thing. And you saw how scared he was when he announced the first indictment of Trump. His hands were shaking at the press conference. Um, but it tells you something about how ridiculous the charges are against Trump, that they had to trump them up by getting somebody that was not even an official appointed officer. And I think Mises' argument is almost undefeatable. And so the uh, if you're going to enforce the Constitution at all. So I think between these two, uh, that it's highly, I think the chances now are better than ever before that there's no criminal trial that goes forward this year against Trump and that all the charges are ultimately forced to be dismissed by Supreme Court action. And that the efforts to exclude him from the ballot completely fail by Supreme Court order. I think that they, the system has been too eager to get Trump and in the process of rushing through it, violated so many rules and laws that they forced the Supreme Court to take preventative action. And now, are, uh, I mean, they would have been much better off if they would have tailored their case to one issue in one case in a selective forum. And they, you know, the, uh, but instead they went from one to the next to the next to the next. And then they hopped it on with that. And it was so abusive that they're forcing the court system, Supreme Court in particular, to take corrective action just to maintain respect for the courts and the judiciary. Robert, before we get to the next one, and before I fall too far behind on the Rumble rants, let's just go get some of these. Oh, never surrender. Silver coin, I can get some of that. Okay, all good guys says novel theory and future hush hush episode run by Barnes. Administrative state fearing Kennedy steps up media narrative that his candidacy is hurting, hurting Trump. Um, okay, I hope they mean metaphorically. Executes a kill order on Kennedy and frames Trump <clears throat> and sons for a hit. Okay. Uh, Freddy65 says, Lara Logan has a great January 6th video last night on X. Please promote it. Well, that's as good as a promo. I'm going to go watch it. I haven't seen it. I'm not your buddy guy. Says, can capitalism exist without corporations? I believe it can. And the only reason I contemplate this is that we are all witnessing our enemies weaponizing corporations against the people in free countries. It's called fascism in its purest sense. I'm not your buddy guy says these people would celebrate the right, aka everyone. They disagree with being sent to camps. I agree with that. Newbie of death. When is Epstein's estate suing for wrongful death, wrongful suicide? And we got Occupant 42. I've been reviewing and updating my when in the course of human events list. All right. <laughs> all right. Robert, what's well, next on the menu? Another case that will impact Trump is the January 6th cases that the Supreme Court has now taken up. They're looking up the, they're going to interpret the obstruction charges uh, for everyone, all of those who have been convicted under that statute. The argument being uh, vo not void for vagueness, but whether or not it was ever intended to apply to these set of circumstances. We've talked about it at length. I know what you feel about it, Robert, but uh, they're going to take it up. Uh, how long they got it. All of these rulings have to be issued by what June of 2024, right? 
Correct. Once the Supreme Court takes it, it's got to decide by June. The ballot okay. case will be decided probably by late February, early March. But the the uh, and they come out at any time. But yes, by June. And I think the Supreme Court, as it has consistently done in in these obstruction cases, whatever the context over the past 25 years, we're talking about Aguilar, you're talking about the Enron cases, talking about Arthur Anderson. They have co- continuously limited these cases because they see how easy it is to abuse them. If you can call disagreement with the government obstruction, which is at times the way the D.C. Court of Appeals has so broadly interpreted this. And let's remember, it split the D.C. Court of Appeals. There was only one honest judge at the district court level that said this couldn't apply. The rest of them are so intimidated by January 6 cases, they refuse to apply the plain language of the law. It's quite obvious that a protest can't be uh, obstruction. That what they meant by obstruction was things like you you do something to contaminate the process in such a way that you prevent the agency or try to prevent the agency from determining the truth. So what is that? That's things like threatening or intimidating a witness. That's things like bribery. That's things like uh, you know falsifying evidence, falsifying testimony, falsifying documents, certain cases destroying documents. But to give you an example, they the in the SEC versus Arthur Anderson case, they said Arthur Anderson couldn't be prosecuted, even though they shredded everything on the eve of the SEC subpoena. They said in, in the Aguilar case, a federal judge lied to FBI agents during a grand jury investigation. And the Supreme Court said that can't be obstruction because he didn't know there was a grand jury. So that gives you an idea of how much they required this nexus. I have to be doing something, intending it, and with the likely impact of preventing by some unlawful means uh, the government from functioning in a certain way. This often comes up in the IRS context where the IRS likes to say, oh, you've been corruptly impairing and impeding the Internal Revenue Service by your protest activities or other activities or by not helping us or by not filing documents or returns. And the courts have consistently said, no, that can't be corruptly impairing and impeding. They've got to lie to you. They've got to bribe somebody. They've got to send you a false document. That's what this is supposed to apply to. Not the idea that under this interpretation, any protest could be interpreted as this. They could go back to the Kavanaugh protesters, lock them all up for 25 years. They could go back to every D.C. protest ever happened, lock them up. There's just no limits on this. And it was always clear that most of these charges were bogus to begin with. There was no meaningful evidence that any of these defendants intended to prevent Congress from uh, determining whether or not the election was done correctly. And this is the game that the January 6th prosecutors and the political hack or coward judges have played in D.C. They've said you were trying to prevent the certification of Biden being president. But that isn't what was going on. What was going on was who was elected president. They weren't trying to prevent the certification process from going on. They wanted the certification process to go on because the proper certification process was to decide who got elected legally and, and, uh, and properly. They always skipped that. The media tries to pretend this was just about certifying Biden. That That's a foregone conclusion that's incorrect. The certification process is about determining who won, not deciding in advance who won and then cert, and then rubber stamping it. So there was no proceeding to even obstruct, nor was there any evidence they even intended to obstruct it. So uh, it, it was a bad uh, adjudications at the district court and court of appeals level, uh, bad prosecutions that have precarious policy implications across the board. And I think the Supreme Court, once they took it, almost, uh, I would say, 80, 85 percent chance they say that these obstruction claims do not apply. And that's going to remove the most serious charge from almost all the January 6th cases. And it would I mean, that would also end Trump's D.C. case. Uh, yeah, yeah, effectively. Um, and what had the, all these people who serve time tough? No, I mean, how does that, how does that practically work? Oh, you, you, you get no remedy. You know, no there's remedy, some but- state laws where you can sometimes sue and get something. But you get no remedy for being wrongfully imprisoned, typically, sadly. Hi, unbelievable. All right, it's okay. Uh, what else is the um, what else are the courts taking up here? Well, speaking of self defense, there's a big Second Amendment case where the oral argument, you know, Roberts and Barrett were terrible at the oral argument, so maybe it won't go the way it should. And the reason why people should pay attention to it is this was the case we discussed in domestic violence context, is because if they approve the law that allows you them to take away your guns without any jury trial, without, in many cases, any judicial finding of anything uh, uh, that that should merit att- attention. They can strip you of your Second Amendment rights based on an order of protection. 
They can strip you of your Second Amendment rights based on any red flag. And then they can do it without any due process or jury trial. So that's the the, the that's why that case is far more significant. And and they hyped up. Uh, I mean, the probably the lawyer could have been a little better prepared for where they might go in the sense of they're like, oh, look at how dangerous uh, your client is. And it's like, well, based on whose determination? And Barrett was like, look at these list of allegations against him. Uh, well, what jury determined that? There wasn't one Supreme Court Justice Barrett. Or did you forget that part of the Constitution like you forgot the right to petition the government uh, uh, when you were before Congress? Uh, all those cheerleaders for Barrett, if she comes down on the wrong decision, are going to be embarrassed once again. Uh, they were wrong on Barrett. Uh, Barrett is a mediocre corporate establishment, old Southern aristocratic act who wants to please and placate the same elites that when she was at Notre Dame Law School was busy imposing vaccine mandates that she vindicated at the Seventh Circuit when she was there. She favorably cited Jacobson, a decision that led to the eugenics decision of Buck v. Bell, was the only basis for Buck v. Bell. Uh, so, you know, this is someone who shouldn't be on the Supreme Court and revealed it once again with her emotional rhetoric. Um, so the uh, that has nothing to do with constitutional law, which she's quite clearly poor at, uh, if this case is any indicator. But it's a very dangerous case because if this case, the Supreme Court approves what happened here, Red flag laws will now be constitutional in America. Re refresh uh, my memory as to what happened in this case. This was the guy, um, someone phoned in that he was suffering some 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 mental distress. Oh, uh, no, this this one is the one where, that's a Fourth Amendment case. This is the one where there's an order of protection taken out. So the order of protection, uh, and usually those, ha and usually what happens is those are done very quickly. They're often done ex parte. The often the defendant signs off just to get it resolved because he can't, you know, uh, get things resolved. What happens is under federal law, automatically, if any court issues an order of protection against you, you lose your gun rights. And that's never been constitutional. In the Fifth Circuit, it never should have been considered constitutional. Fifth Circuit said it is. It violates the Second Amendment under the plain logic of the Bruin decision. Supreme Court took it up and Roberts and Barrett were more concerned with the facts alleged than they were the Second Amendment, uh, you know, the, in their emotional political ploy. And so that that's a precarious sign because that's how all red flag laws green light. It's like, oh, you don't want the crazy person with a gun, right? You don't want the violent person with a gun, right? You don't want the domestic abuser with a gun, right? Well, uh, everybody gets the right to self-defense, number one. Uh, and unless they're criminally convicted in court of a crime. And secondly, and only then of certain crimes. And, and then secondly, the, the issue is the process. Who determines whether the person's crazy? Who determines whether the person is a danger to the community? Because we already know they consider if you say certain things on the internet, questioning the Fauci narrative, you are considered dangerous to the community. So the red flag laws are extremely dangerous. They should be shut down constitutionally. The right decision in this case would do that. The wrong decision would open it up, green light it fully. And all those people that cheered Barrett should write me apologies later. Well, and I presume you're not you're not down with administrative tribunals to to process uh, red flag application, criminal conviction, and then only as relates to specific types of crimes where uh, uh, preclusion system with our founding. And if it was something that it was a grounds to remove your gun rights at the time of our founding then okay. But that's that's limited to very specific, limited circumstances, understandably so. Otherwise, the Brits, the, the king just screwed up with how he could have taken away people's guns, or you know, original government. The, I mean, because we were in protest of those policies and forming these rights and, and, and fashioning these amendments. It's, oh, you just, just accuse them of something and you can take it all away. This is my Eighth Amendment argument against conservatives that don't like bail. The, the, you're giving the state the right to lock people up. How'd that work out in the January 6th cases? Locked up for years. No means to defend themselves. The I get it. You, you look at it when you see the person let out for some serious criminal accusation and you don't like it. But that's called the Eighth Amendment. Who are you going to give the power to? Second Amendment gave it to the people. Eighth Amendment took it away from the courts. And yet what we're doing here is saying, you know, just on an accusation, you can lose your Second Amendment right of self-defense. I, I to I'm totally ignorant Canadian to this hype, not hypothetically, but back in the day of the Constitution, what would have been the grounds for uh, barring someone from owning a gun? 
Very, very limited. You'd already been previously convicted. They could require you to, or, or previously certain findings. Then you could be required to post a bond in certain circumstances in terms of being able to carry it in public. Uh, and the and then, uh, then you could be restricted in terms of you're convicted of murder or other crimes, then you're locked up or other things. So a lot of your freedoms can be taken away in that context. But that was about it. There were very few limitations on your right to defend yourself. Because it was about also individuals were given the power of the state. The point of the militia was that we would not have a standing army and the militia would enforce the law. And that, that required ordinary people and ordinary people would thus be a check on the abuse of the concentration of power. It was no centralized power of taxation internally, no standing army. And the two were the means by which the constitutional republic would be protected from politicians. And they want to take it away from the people and give it back to the politicians, which is what our constitution was all about preventing. And that relates to the other big, big case before the Supreme Court, which is the power of direct taxation. If they approve the tax that went through on foreign investments, that will mean they can directly impose a property tax on America. They could tax you for just living. The IRS in the 1930s wanted to actually tax people for cooking their own food, cooking your own food. That's what they wanted to tax them for. The, the, I mean, for if you do any labor in your own home, you would have to pay a tax on it. They could, this is the hated head tax, the capitation tax that was so offensive to people at the time of our founding that helped lead to America. And that case is also pending before the Supreme Court. So do you have a right to bear arms, to defend yourself against the state and be the means of enforcement for the state uh, the, in ways that protect ordinary people's rights? And do you have the right to not have all your property and liberty stripped from you under the guise of confiscatory taxation? Both the Supreme Court's going to decide in the next six months. It's amazing. Coming from Canada, where you have no Second Amendment rights and they tax you up the wazoo for everything and anything. 15% sales tax, government, federal, provincial, uh, property tax, 44% income tax, depending on your bracket. Yeah, no, that's it. Uh, no, no, oh, exactly. Right. They're, they're not yet taxing you to breathe, but they're not letting you get your oven cooked bagels because it's bad for the environment. In the last big cases before the Supreme Court concerned big tech, can big tech and the Biden administration collude to censor? which is the Missouri versus Biden case pending before the Supreme Court of the United States. And can, can big tech enjoy certain monopolistic practices uh, and censor on its own accord when it's a, uh, effectively a public forum against these laws passed by states of Texas and Florida, trying to prohibit them from doing so? The, uh, those cases concern, and then there's several other big tech, big cases before the Supreme Court, but the future of big tech, and its power to censor, its power to control, its power to monopolize our ability to limit their monopolistic abuse of power also will be determined in the next six months. And those will be the other but big cases to watch. The problem is Missouri versus Biden, you know, even if the court comes down and says what the government did was improper and you have to have a bit more distance between government and private big tech, I mean, they're just going to get more surreptitious in the manner in which they do it. In which case, I mean, it's it's the idea that it's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. When when big tech knows what the government wants and how they can work together, they don't really have to be as explicit about it as Jen Psaki and Biden might have been. So they'll just be more discreet and more surreptitious going forward. What could possibly be a long lasting practical resolution that would prevent it from happening again one way, in, in, in a more subtle form? And well, the scope of the injunction was pretty broad. So the the weakness, if if the injunction is affirmed, Big tech will stay away from any degree of censorship uh, because they don't want to get into contempt charges or all of that. So the uh, the it's highly it depends on the decision. But if the injunction is affirmed uh, in its current form or primary or substantively substantially in its current form, then big tech censorship will radically reduce. If they also say that Texas and Florida laws are enforceable, which allow any person to sue and get their attorney's fees, then you're going to see them do a lot less cancel culture, a lot less blocking because they're not going to pay everybody's attorney's fees every time they do it. That's just not that that's not manageable for them because then there will be lawyers that line up and they only do that. Sue Twitter tomorrow, sue YouTube tomorrow, sue Google tomorrow, sue whomever tomorrow for block, sue Facebook, sue Instagram for blocking access. And all they're doing is writing check after check after check after check to lawyers and they have to reinstate the person anyway. So that that's where that case has meaningful consequence as well. And then there's the other big tech cases pending about their entire economic practice, like the or the case in the Oracle case and the other case, Facebook cases that concern how they were doing business advertising, how they're monetizing and commoditizing 
private information of people. And if they can't do that economically or have to restore the monies, then their entire economic model is, is shattered. And then there's the antitrust cases pending in multiple jurisdictions that could determine that they have to break up entirely and Google no longer own YouTube. So big consequences for big tech over the next six months and, and uh, that will shape the future of our ability to communicate on the, the digital public square. There will be oral hearings that we will be able to listen yeah. to. And there'll be oral about. arguments on all of these. Okay. So yeah. the, uh, uh, yeah, so big, big cases before the spring. The future of American constitutional democracy will be determined in the next six months. It, I, 2024 is going to be the biggest year. I mean, obviously for a number of reasons, but I, I think it's not an exaggeration to say the biggest year in American history. Right. Yeah, after definitely from an American legal history. No, no question about that, in my opinion. <clears throat> Uh, you Robert could argue Hull Dred Scott, 1851, but that was limited to one, you know, issue, a big issue, obviously. Uh, I mean, I mean, unfortunately, the Supreme, I get people that are skeptical of the Supreme Court. Supreme Court failed in 1851 when they, their Dred Scott decision gave us the Civil War. And it was the wrong decision, by the way. Uh, then and then their sort of inconsistency in the early 1900s, granting and greenlighting eugenics uh, helped was the justification for the Nazis to do what they did and led to all of that horror. Uh, and, and, you know, more often than not, Korematsu, they're on the wrong side, Jacobson on the wrong side, Buck v. Bell on the wrong side, Dred Scott, wrong side, Plessy v. Ferguson, wrong side. There's a long list of decisions. I mean, they were the ones who created segregation in the South. They were the ones who decided not to enforce civil rights or civil liberties for a half a century in the South that led to all the problems in the South. So, I mean, the history of the Supreme Court fails when it's tested. Um, I am hoping that this time they are politically cognizant enough that they don't fail this time. I, w I wish you hadn't said uh, the Dred Scott decision was a failure of the court that led to the Civil War. That sounds like the crossroads that we might be at. these. It, days. it really is. It really is. I mean, if they do something, let Trump be excluded from the ballot. You've got a disaster. I mean, even Eric Holder is acknowledging this. Right? I mean, high ranking Democrats are saying uh, this is a very bad idea. They haven't even they still haven't quite put the math together that if you take Trump off the ballot in states like Illinois, Colorado, Maine and California. I mean, Newsom has done the math. Because he's the heat said, no, 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 we're not doing that in California. Uh, but in Illinois, Colorado, or Maine, the most likely impact is that Biden may lose those electoral votes that are otherwise almost a lock because Robert Kennedy absorbs all the Trump vote. So they, they haven't done, some people have done the political math. Bill Barr has done the political math. Gavin Newsom's done the political math. I mean, this was a guy who six months ago was gung-ho on excluding Trump from the ballot. Now he's like, no, 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 I, I, we should never do that. Uh, it probably has something to do with Robert Kennedy being on the ballot. Uh, doesn't mean they won't try to stop to keep him off the ballot. But historically, those efforts fail as well because the system doesn't like the world to know that we have less of a functioning constitutional democracy than the, the, uh, the countries we like to uh, condemn. There's more candidate, there, will, there will still be more candidates on the presidential ballot in Russia than there is in the United <laughs> States in the 2024 election. Oh, yeah, and the, and the journalists in Russia get actually less uh, prison time than the Jan 6 protesters in America. Completely. Uh, now, speaking of rogue agencies and why we shouldn't give them this kind of power in the first place, Amos the Miller. raid on Amos Miller. Hold on. Before we get there, Robert, let me read three rumble rants uh, before. And then we're going to get into this. Uh, let me see here. Hold on. It's going to be four rumble rants. The monopolies we have now are a result of government regulations and laws because the companies pay off the politicians. This has been a problem since the days of Robert Fulton, at least from T1990. Shofar. I have no faith in the courts to do the right thing. They have proven they don't want to stand up to tyranny as a third branch of government. Rumbold, Rumbold says, get your kid a nice present for me. Thank you very much, Rumbold. And Rumbold says, here it is. Here is how I met you in a dream world, Viva. And I'm going to go look at what this is afterwards. Okay, Robert, what happened with... So, look, everybody knows what's been going on with Amos Miller. Uh, Amish farmer up in Pennsylvania has been, you know raising, breeding, slaughtering, distributing his own meat uh, to his own customers who buy it in full awareness of fact and law, want the meat that is not jacked up with hormones, antibiotics, all this other crap. Uh, the feds come in and say, you're violating the rules of the FDA as relate to slaughter and distribution of meat. And if you don't abide by those rules, you can't sell outside of the state. They can't sell anywhere, basically. Uh, they've been harassed for uh, an extensive period of time. You can, you can highlight that. And then, I, when was it? Two days ago, they get raided allegedly, or not allegedly, they get um, visited by who? Fe I mean, feds? Depend who? Not the feds. Who? The Pennsylvania who? Department of Agriculture. 
Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture comes to inspect Amos Miller's farm yet again. What, what happened? I mean, we only saw one video on Twitter. What was the purpose of their visit? What were they there to do? What did they in fact do? And what the heck is going on? So the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture has been lurking in the shadows behind the campaigns against Amos Miller. Uh, we use the Sunshine Laws and the Open Records Act laws that are kind of your state version of Freedom of Information Act or FOIA laws to inquire into about nine months ago uh, what the state of Pennsylvania had been up to all along during these cases. And it turned out that the uh, state of Pennsylvania started everything, that they didn't like Amos Miller and the success of an Amish farmer and uh, the success of an Amish farmer exporting that, that way of life to others. They wanted him shut down, but they didn't have any legal basis to do so. And they didn't have the political chutzpah to try it. So they instead referred his case to the Food and Drug Administration on the grounds of challenging uh, his all-natural, non-homogenized milk sales. The FDA looked at it and decided there was nothing for them to do. And they transferred it at the request of the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, according to these files, to the U.S. Department uh, of Agriculture and said, go after him on meat. Uh, there's amenable meats, certain things that are governed for uh, under the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, and they decided that they were going to assert control over it, did multiple raids, seized a bunch of meat. And at one point prior to my representation of them, we're seeking a bankrupting judgment that would against he and his wife that would take away his farm and put him in prison. We ultimately reached a resolution with the U.S. Department of Agriculture that removed all the risk of that. No more bankrupting judgment. No more uh, sentencing anybody to imprisonment. No more contempt. All of it got satisfactorily resolved with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And we're still in progress and in process of what else we can achieve in resolution with the USDA so that the private members of Amos Miller, who are the only people he distributes food to, he does not sell them commercially in the open market, doesn't sell them at grocery stores, doesn't sell them at food stands. He only sells it to people that have informed consent at what they're getting. And it's people who want it the way he makes it. They don't want it any other way, whether it's milk, whether it's cheese, whether it's yogurt, whether it's beef, whether it's poultry, whether it's bison, whatever it might, whether it's buffalo, whatever it might be. And the FDA, USDA has uh, worked together to get resolution. And throughout this process, the state of Pennsylvania was often on the phone call in the case when we were talking to the judge about it. And they voiced no objection at all to this process. So then all of a sudden after new, now what has happened is the Pennsylvania, the uh, Amos is being successful, that he's able to get resolution, keep functioning. People continue to support him. People continue to like his product, but people, people are keeping him afloat. And consequently, I think the people at the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture who have been following these cases in the press, been following me in the press, uh, were unhappy that it looked like Amos would be successful and that more people would get to enjoy the benefits of Amos Miller's uh, extraordinary uh, food. Uh, that's the best food I've ever eaten, period. And I've eaten at the greatest restaurants literally in the world. Uh, I've never had a better meal than I had at Amos Miller's. And so, uh, and then you look at the Amish. I mean, this is what's really lurking politically in the background. The Amish are an, an alternative control group. There is a, you know, who is it out there that isn't inundated with big food controlled by monopolistic corporations. Most Americans still don't know that almost 80 to 90% of the food distributed in America that we eat come from a small number of big corporations who, who, just, uh, who use every kind of fertilizer, every kind of chemical, every kind of additive known to man. They've been wiping out small farmers all across America and consolidating power, whether it's pig farmers, or chicken farmers, or cattle farmers. And they've been consolidating and monopolizing their power. There was a little glimpse of this when we suddenly had a meat shortage during the pandemic. It's like, how do we have a meat shortage? It's because at any point in these big supply chains, if there's a problem, all of a sudden that 90% of our food goes away. So uh, Thomas Massey is currently trying to pass the Prime Act in Congress to give more power to ordinary farmers to farm the way they want and the way they have traditionally and the way their customers want them to, and more power to the ordinary person to decide what goes in our body. We pick our menu, not the U.S. Department of Agriculture, who during the time the USDA and the State Department of Agriculture have been picking our menu, we've got fatter, 
We've died sooner. We've had more disease. We've had all these other problems. The Amish are also free of big tech. They don't use social media. They're not out there. There's other people that use social media on their behalf, but they don't. Their kids aren't sitting there on TikTok nine, you know, uh, all day long. They are outside the big educational structure. Their kids don't go to public schools. Their kids don't go to Harvard. They don't go to any of those universities. They get educated the same way that their forefathers were educated. So they're, And they don't use all the vaccines, all the big pharma. Well, what's happened? We've had a real-life control group over the last half century. What happens when you're free of big food? What happens when you're free of big pharma? What happens when you're free of big tech? What happens when you're free of our educational structure? You get healthier, happier people who live longer lives. There has been no autism explosion in the Amish community. There has been no anxiety explosion in the autism community. There has been no depression explosion in the autism community. There has been no self-harm and suicide explosion in, in the, uh, in the uh, Amish community. There's been no cancer explosion in the Amish community. So this is for the statists and the bureaucrats and the corporate monopolists. This is a, a, an egregious, this is a blaring signal of how corrupt their system of governance has become of our lives. But I, I'm going to get to st- two things I've been pulling up in the backdrop while you talk about this, Robert. It's amazing. First of all, what does the what does Pennsylvania, what does the state want from uh, uh, from Amos Miller and all of this? Do they want to? They want to destroy the Amish way of life. What made Amos the primary target, and they've lied about this. The, there were some local Lancaster media publications that were lying about him this week. Great credit to Lancaster Patriot who covered this extensively, is doing a fundraiser for him uh, because the goal has been to financially freeze him in such a way that he can't function and has to shut down anyway. And it will take too long to get relief or remedy in the process because the Amish don't sue. This is part of the, the Amish don't sue. The Amish don't seek publicity. This was, this is part of what makes them vulnerable target. And the Amish as a whole are so disconnected from the what's happening in the outside world and are so good faith in how they, they, they uh, you know, Amos treats everyone like he, he, he himself is. So he, he's very trusting towards these people, tries to engage them, tries to work with them, tries to negotiate with them, and, what, and, and doesn't realize how they're acting in bad faith because in the Amish world, that's kind of foreign to their entire life experience, to their entire lived experience. So they, here's what terrifies the, the entire apparatchiks of, of these commiecrats in positions of power and influence, uh, many of whom are corporate bought off. I mean, these people either go to or from right back to the big corporate world, the big ag world, big food world, big farmer world that they're supposedly regulating and controlling. They're working on behalf of to shut down the small producer and take away our individual rights to control our own bodies. I mean, that this is the, the, all of the policies of the USDA, the FDA, the state departments of agriculture, all of them fundamentally are about taking away our rights to informed consent, to strip what Nuremberg was supposed to establish for us for forever. That's why that federal judge went ballistic when I filed a Nuremberg claim. He doesn't want the system exposed at what it's doing. It's trying to reinstate the same logic that led to eugenics in the first place. Not a coincidence they love the Jacobson case, the only case cited for forced sterilization in America as the grounds for it in Buck v. Bell. So the thing was, it, but what made Amos in particular a target was he was exporting this lifestyle to all the, those who wanted to join. So he, the people are like, oh, I can actually get food that tastes good and is good for me. I don't have to get, you go to any working class grocery store in America, Mexican-American, African-American, blue, white, ethnic, whatever. You know, like the Mexican grocery stores I went to outside Austin, Texas. You can't even find healthy food in there. It is all filled with sugar and processed foods that's going to kill you early. And, you know, don't have to pay as much Social Security. Don't have to pay as much pension. Let these working class people work until they're no longer functional as workers. And then we've killed them off with the way we've used our food supply. People like Alex Jones have been talking about this for a quarter century, that this is part of a systematic objective. So Amos Miller is providing an exit ramp from big food. And and he's just saying, hey, this is the way my grandfather made it. My great grandfather made it. My great grandfather make it. I think you guys might like it. People like we want it exactly like you do it, because once we get it, we're never going back to big food. And that's what terrifies the commiecrats in all these food and drug administration level officials, whether at the state or federal level. And, the, uh, and so what they did is they went and executed a search warrant on Amos Miller's farm. Now, keep in mind, they've known of my representation for years. 
They were on the phone calls. They never once objected to anything we were doing with the feds. Not once. Number two, they have never reached out to me a single time suggesting they think he should be a registered food establishment, that he should be a licensed retail seller, that he should have a permitted milk selling license. Ever, ever in that entire time period. Not once. And so what they do is they go and get a search warrant, even though Pennsylvania statutes don't give them the legal authority to bring a search warrant. Their search warrant authority is very circumscribed. It says, okay, let's say you have a contaminated animal, and that's what you're worried about. Or let's say it's a commercial feed operation. Selective set of circumstances that were completely inapplicable here. The, the judge was such a rubber stamp, a pitiful, disgraceful rubber stamp of a judge in Pennsylvania that the judge didn't even look to see whether the search warrant alleged a crime because that's what you have to have to do a search warrant. You have to have probable cause of a crime. There isn't one alleged. There's no probable cause of a crime. The judge is you know, rubber stamp. That's what a lot of judges do in America. You, you, you can blow a leaf across the desk of many judges in America, and if the government's the one blowing that leaf, they rush to sign it. Uh, disgraceful. So you have no allegation of a crime. Then they lie. High-ranking officials for the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, they lie by omission and they lie by commission. They lie by omission by excluding the entire history of me in there. Like an honest judge, an honorable judge doing their job would have looked at that affidavit and say, why is the last fact you allege concerning your interaction with Amos Miller almost two years ago? Why is that? And now you're seeking a search warrant. Something happened two years ago, three years ago, because they had to tell that lie by omitting all of my representation, all of the federal settlements that would have told a very different story that would have led a judge to go, oh, hold on. There's no grounds for a search warrant here. One, there's no allegation of a crime. Two, there's no basis of your agency even having the authority to do the search warrant. But three, there's no even factual grounds of anything here. Because to give you an idea of what the search warrant was based on, they thought maybe he's an unregistered food establishment. Maybe he's an unlicensed retail seller. Maybe he's an unpermitted milk seller. None of which is grounds for a search warrant in the first place. But but I, I don't know. Is there not an obligation when you know that someone is represented, even if it's the state executing a search warrant, that they at least serve it on you first before serving it on? Uh... Well, and, and in the outreach. So, for example, they claim in the search warrant that a concern was arisen that one person got sick somewhere from eggnog. That's it. OK, if you think that's the case, you reach out. We'll go in. We'll test it. No problem. Make sure everything's fine. I mean, to give you an idea. They falsely accused Amos Miller before, uh, of, I mean, almost a decade ago. It was all nonsense. And it, it's been nonsense in the past about this in general. They tried to create a listeria scare about raw milk. They've tried to create all these scares that have been, you compare anywhere the health re record of Amos Miller to a ra random restaurant in Philly. And I guarantee you, Amos Miller comes out number well, one and way ahead. Robert, I, I'm still traumatized. I was brought up being told that unpasteurized milk will get you sick and you'll die if you drink it. I mean, I, I still have that residue even as an adult. Exactly. I mean, I mean, they would just tell lie after lie after lie after lie after lie because it's about corporate control and status control of what we eat and how what we have access to as what we eat. But of course, their unlawful conduct doesn't end there. They didn't have grounds to have a search warrant under the statute. They didn't have ground. They didn't establish probable cause of any crime whatsoever. They omitted information about the entire history of what's happened over the last two years. And then they kind of deliberately lied by making it appear they had gone to him before about registration or about licensure in ways that are not really accurate at all and leave out all kinds of information and are just material misrepresentations of fact. And this, by the way, is one of the highest ranking officials of the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture because they've all been sitting up there in Scranton and elsewhere of uh, conspiring to go after and, and uh, Amos Miller for, for, for almost a decade. Now, the when they get there, they tell Amos Miller that he can't see anything. He's not allowed to be in there and just watch them do it. Then no one is. But there was press there. The press asked to be able to monitor what was going on. Nope, kicked out. What is it they have to hide? Now, take for example, let's say you're going to go in there and sample the food product. How you do that is critical that you don't contaminate it yourself. And if you saw some of the people going in there, Let's just say they aren't beacons of health. <laughs> uh, so, the, the, so why wouldn't you want 
people to observe it. If it's an honest process, if it's a transparent process, if it's a legitimate process. Well, I'm not saying that I'm skeptical, but they'll 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 contaminate it themselves. I mean, who, exactly. Who... That'd be the frankly, it's the only reason to exclude people. And so that that's problem number four. The the way you execute a search warrant has to be reasonable. Then you have problem number five. The search warrant did not authorize them to detain food. The search warrant authorized them to seize necessary items for sampling purposes only concerning dairy products. But what do you think they did? On the way out, they stuck a sign on his door saying he's not allowed to detain, sell anything or do anything or sample anything that was in the freezer. So what does that do? That prohibits him from being able to counter any fake evidence they come up with about sampling the evidence. Again, you know, if you're going to take on this kind of high profile case, wouldn't you want it to be done with impeccable, uh, uh, unquestionable integrity? They've done it exactly the opposite because they know this is, this is a guy who's been looked at by everybody under a microscope for a decade. And they can't find anything wrong with his food. They know it. The people love his food. People don't get sick from his food. It's where you get sick and what's killing you is what Big Ag is telling you to eat. It's what the FDA is telling you to eat on their food pyramid. Uh, get your latest, you know, dumping of processed foods, of foods that, you know, help made by the Rockefeller of the world. The uh, So you, you look at, in fact, they're behind a lot of the processing. That's another story altogether. The uh, almost everything bad in the world you can trace to a, a Rockefeller, uh, just a little side point. But the but the, the detention order is not, is not part of the search warrant. So what they did was a general warrant. So what founded the Fourth Amendment was no more general warrants. What would happen is the Brits would just come in and just randomly ransack your entire property. Property. This is called the requirement of particularity. So one, the warrant wasn't sufficiently particular for the court to sign in the first place. But putting that problem aside, in their execution of it, there's nothing in the warrant that says you can just randomly inspect anything you want and you can randomly detain anything you want, including food that had absolutely nothing to do with what they were there to sample. Like, they I mean, buffalo meat was frozen from him. They just wanted to shut him down. They know if we shut him down, he's going to refund his customers because that's the kind of guy he is, uh, as many as he can. And he and because of the number of people who work for him, because of the scale of his operation, because of the limited uh, refriger limited life of some of the foods he has. The food, the food would go bad. Exactly. That he that they can bankrupt him. That's the entire goal. Because the, the, and, and they know he's not going to sue. So they're like, OK, to go through the administrative process, these other process is going to take him too long. And by the end of it, he'll be broke. And we'll say, see, we broke Amos Miller. And then they're going for everybody else in the Amish community. The Unfortunately, the Amish community is still asleep at the wheel about this. I've talked to them multiple times, tried to explain what's going on. It, to them, it's so foreign, they can't imagine it. They can't even conceive that their way of life, which is is great for everybody, not a threat to anyone, is a threat to people with real power. And that those people with real power want to crush them. And that this is going to make the school fight from a half century ago look like small change. Because if the Amish can't control their own food, then the Amish way of life will disappear because their employment is based on that. Not just how they eat, not just what they eat, not just where they eat, but their entire economy is. Strip them of their ability to farm, and you strip them of their ability to maintain their way of life entirely. And then there's no more alternative control group to scream out to the rest of us of the problems with big food dominated uh, uh, system. What ended up happening with the state's attempt to seize or, or freeze the, uh, the the foods? Well, it's it's detained. I mean, he can't do anything. If he does anything, he's been threatened that they'll put him in prison. So the, the there'll be a request made to lift it, the Secretary of Agriculture has five days to uh, either lift it or make detailed factual findings that meet a very high evidentiary standard if he wanted to try to destroy it or relabel it. That they don't have. They don't have any factual basis for Buffalo. They don't have any factual basis for any of it. I mean, any of it. It's, it's all garbage. If they thought there was a problem with eggnog, you just test the eggnog. I mean, they're, they're, it's ludicrous. And you have one incident that you think might be connected to him over a decade and a half? He's the guy you go after? Well, did, There's did, an incident every day somewhere in Philadelphia. Have you eaten at some of the places in Philadelphia? Well, did, did, I mean, did any, it's did the, ludicrous. Did the guy, These people the, are frauds. They're fakes. They're phonies. They're misusing and abusing their power. They violated every rule and law known to man. 
And we are going to find ways to seek remedy, creative ways. Uh, there are customers that may have a right to sue because they have a, a possessory property interest as members of his association in that food that was unlawfully and illegally detained. So if they don't release it, we will be bringing civil rights suits related there too on their behalf because that doesn't require Amos be a named plaintiff. Um, and we'll seek the uh, release of the, uh, the product a, as immediately as possible. We will try to get it independently sampled to make sure they can't lie about them like they're trying to do and planning to do. Uh, because that the scaremongering is always the approach they take. Uh, be very skeptical of that approach. He wouldn't have the customer base he had if there was ever any problem with his food. Just do the math. Everybody knows it. So the that's will be a bunch of garbage that they're coming with next. And I'll try to defend him in every possible way. And thanks, you know, the Lancaster uh, Patriot, which covered it, which exposed large parts of it, which Thomas Massey, Congressman Massey, retweeted out, thankfully. Uh, there's a great fundraiser going on. I got it pinned at the vivabarnslaw.locals.com board. It's also pinned on my X account at uh, Barnes underscore law, where you can donate to him. Uh, the goal is to raise 150000 because the scale of his operation is such that that's what he needs to raise to be able to substitute for being put out of business. Not all of us. He still has inventory. So there's, there's, there's some inventory still out there. So people like his product, go and get his product. That's another way you can support him. The, uh, uh, but for all the product that got frozen, that part of his business, uh, that got detained, uh, if we're able to raise 150000 then that will give us that will give Amos a 60-day window to be able to stay economically afloat because he has to pay. There's all these things he has to pay every month. They know that because they've been secretly involved in all the federal stuff behind the scenes, according to the various communications that we got from the Open Records Act Sunshine Laws. So keep Amos Miller afloat, and you can keep our own exit ramp available from the control of big food and big government. I want to bring up two things, Robert, that I had on the backdrop while you were talking. Uh, li listen to this. The average life expectancy for the Amish people over 70 years, while the average American was only 47 during the earliest 20th century, Amish people still have a notable edge in late life health quality with lower chances of serious illness that are very common for the rest of the world. Then you go down here. I mean, it's so amazing. Do Amish hold the key to a longer life? Study finds anti-aging gene in religious group. So we've just answered one question. They live longer than the average population. Is it because of health? Is it because of diet? Is it because of an inherent gene that they have, which is totally unrelated to both? That was one. Then the other one, which I thought was just hilarious. Listen to this. Uh, no, no evidence. No evidence that Amish kids have, quote, zero cancer, diabetes, and autism. Yeah, because that's always been the claim, that it's zero. There's not one example of cancer or whatever. You For go down the article. don't know, that is your classic definition of a scarecrow argument. <laughs> that, uh, the, or straw, straw man. Straw man, straw straw man, man. argument. The, uh, I always think of the straw man as a scarecrow. Because it's that, too, in this context. The, uh, uh, that they use a straw man argument to scarecrow people away from the truth. Well, and it, what they don't want to talk about is that it's, that everything is extremely low in the Amish community. Right, right, right here. You and they know, attribute you, to the, I mean, look at type two diabetes, very low. Oh, it, it must be because they're so physically active. Oh, that yeah, no, helps, <laughs> but that, it, that isn't the main reason. It's the food supply. We all know it's the food supply. It, it's, it's amazing because it starts off with the no, there's not zero. Of course, nobody, no idiot would say that. And if there's one Facebook post that does, nobody believes it to be that. Yes, lower in type two diabetes. What was the other one here? And then you just go down here. They say, uh, uh, oh, here we go. They, they, they found the appears to stave off diseases uh, of aging well, by reducing but, levels of protein. Yeah, but my favorite part is the, uh, you know, other studies have documented cancer. Oh, their rates are much lower, but th there's some. I mean, it's, you know, the, it's ludicrous. It, so it's, that's it's where I think. Uh, so uh, thanks to everybody that went to the uh, fundraiser to continue to keep him afloat uh, out there, because that's the best way to immediately counter this. Uh, if you wanted the, the, the legal fundraising uh, is done at free America law center, uh, dot com. You can go there and donate to support the legal fees. I'm continuing to do all that work, whether we get paid or not. Uh, hopefully, I mean, what it is, is that work went from being a modest amount for the next 60 days to a very large amount for the next 60 days uh, because they just they just won't give up coming after the guy. Uh, the other factor may have been here. The federal judge assigned the case had been pretty fair recently passed away. And I think they saw that as a Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture saw that as a window of opportunity that there was, OK, no judge supervised, you know, whatever judge gets reassigned. You don't know what that judge's uh, politics is going to be like uh, there. Let's just say there's an interesting mix there in Philly. 
Um, and so the uh, that may have been part of the reason too. But you know, the, as long as we keep him afloat, uh, people asked how Amos is handling it. He always he stays cool during all this. You know, he's just going to keep trying. Well, all he wants to do is provide the food that people want, that people demand, actually, quite frankly, uh, and keep the Amish way of life alive for he and his family, that his kids can carry on the same tradition that he is carrying on, that his father did, that his grandfather did, that his grand grandfather did. I mean, he goes all the way back to some of the ori- his family line, some of the original Amish in America, um, who have survived every effort at persecution uh, for centuries. And this is just the newest wave, uh, but it's the most dangerous wave, not only to the Amish, but to all of our freedoms and liberties, including our own ability to choose what goes into our own bodies, well, which relates to the other the other thing the Amish don't do. They don't take a whole lot of vaccines. Well, oh, but Robert, the fact check said that there's vaccination is quite common. I guess certain types of vaccination vaccines. is not the number of vaccines. And, and I guess maybe the ones that are actually vaccines and the ones that actually work. Speaking of which, Robert, I will not call it a vaccine, but what's the latest on Brooke Jackson's whistleblower lawsuit as relates to the bungled bullshit trials that Pfizer was conducting that she was a part of? Um, yeah, give us the update on where, where, where things are at with that. So uh, they filed the uh, Pfizer filed their motion to dismiss. We have now filed our opposition to the motion to dismiss. I shared it at the board at Viva Barnes Law that locals dot com uh, highlighted uh, version of it in the Barnes Law School series. And the uh, now they'll file their reply and then it'll be up to the court whether and when to schedule oral oral argument on their motion to dismiss. Uh, argument is simple. It's their their claim is this. We, we have alleged fraud in the inducement. That's the claim the court allowed us to reinstate. And their argument is our fraud, the Pfizer's fraud came later. The Pfizer's always got creative arguments with this, right? So they're like, our fraud might have been inducing the payment, but it wasn't inducing the contract. Ha ha ha. So that's not real fraud in the inducement because the contract wasn't induced by fraud, just the payment was. Uh, and the, I mean, imagine these defenses being asserted in like a state criminal proceeding. Well, th- this, this is, th- this is after they've already ma- uh, argued the defense that uh, it wasn't fraud because the government knew. Yeah, exactly. Now, they're still making that argument. The story, but it's not material, uh, because we are, we're still getting the checks. And as long as we're still getting the checks, well, then clearly it's not a problem. The, uh, uh the two legal problems with their argument is fraud in the inducement is all about payment. It's not just limited to the contract. It's whatever let, in fact, the whole fraud is that payment was received for something that it should not have been received for because you did something materially wrong to get that payment. That's what it's all it is. Whether you classify it as implied certification, false certification, whatever the language or terminology you want to use, that's what it's all about. This is what Justice Thomas said in Escobar, the leading case concerning False Claims Act and Ketam in America, said, look at the essence of the bargain. And for those that don't remember, the essence of the bargain, as articulated in the Defense Department uh, contract itself, was that Pfizer promised to deliver a safe, effective vaccine that would prevent the transmission of COVID-19 at speed and scale. The only thing they delivered was speed and scale. They didn't deliver safety. They didn't deliver efficacy. They didn't deliver a vaccine. And it never prevented COVID-19. Oh, Robert, that's they never said- the fraud, and they got paid billions of dollars for that fraud. Robert, they never said it would prevent transmission. If you go to Albert Bourla's they did the contract. Tweet- oh. Ooh, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, that's the problem. It's in the, it's in the contract. They said, this is what we're going to deliver to you. They didn't. And it, it's, it's said over six different times in six different ways. So, uh, I mean, and that's the essence of the bargain. Does anybody really believe the, that the U.S. taxpayer would pay money for something that wouldn't prevent COVID-19? that wouldn't inoculate as a vaccine should, that would wasn't effective against COVID-19's transmission and infection rate, that wasn't something that was safe, but could cause death and disability at the rate it has. Of course not. Nobody's buying that. And that's why that, so that's problem one with their defense is their, oh, our fraud came in the inducing the payment, not the inducement of the contract. It also came in the inducement of the contract because they got rid of ivermectin, helped coordinate the efforts against ivermectin in order that there be no alternatives, because that's the only way they could get EUA authorization, is if there was no alternative treatments available for COVID-19. That's why they were complicit in undermining ivermectin safety and efficacy for the treatment of COVID-19 with their media partners and allies where they advertise so much money. If you were watching over the holidays, you saw Pfizer ads bombarding you 
uh, and Moderna ads bombarding him uh, with false advertising to this day, in my opinion. The, uh, but so they actually fraudulently induced the contract as well as the payment. But on top of that is to their materiality claim. Materiality is when I know of the, al- I believe the allegation is true, but I still write a check. So for example, Trump's civil case, right? Even if they believed that Trump's real estate was worth 1% of what he claimed, what they testified to is that wouldn't have mattered because he had a hundred other ways to pay back with a collateral and confidence in his repayment ability, which was proven by his actual repayment. That's something that's immaterial. It wouldn't change my mind, even if I agreed that it was true. The what the FD what Pfizer misled the court about the first time around was suggesting that all that mattered was whether a check got issued, not whether or not the FDA and the Defense Department agreed with Brooke Jackson's allegations that the vaccine is not safe and not effective, not even a vaccine. It doesn't prevent COVID-19 based on the information she saw and blew the whistle on while she was a clinical trial investigator there on the assi- on assignment of the project. And, that, and the federal judge recognized that. He said, you know what? Materiality really requires they believe the allegations are true. And that they don't have an answer to because they cannot produce any proof. No government official is willing to go on the record for Pfizer. They weren't able to get it in their, in, in their initial brief. They're not going to be able to get in their reply that says, yes, Brooke Jackson is right. This isn't safe. This isn't effective. This isn't a vaccine. This doesn't prevent COVID-19, but we don't care. There's no government official that's going to go on the record on that because then, they, then they're the criminal. And so that's Pfizer's problem. They can't get anybody to go on a record with their claim that the government was in cahoots with them. And because of that, we uh, overcome the materiality objection. We overcome the objection about when the fraud occurred, payment or contract. And we should be entitled to discovery in the case later this year. We'll find out from the court. Robert, I feel so stupid. Just every now and again, when you make that, the I'm going to the South Africa contract, 1.56 vaccine, quote, shall include all vaccines manufactured in whole or in part or supplied directly or indirectly by or on behalf of Pfizer or BioNTech or any of their affiliates that are intended for the prevention of the human disease COVID-19. Holy crap. That's do what's I in have, all these contracts. Do I have my next- and my they breached next... it because as they later admitted, they never even tested for it correctly. No, but I, mean, I keep having these fights with people on Twitter that cause more uh, uh, more stress than they should. They never said it would prevent transmission. You mother They did their contract to get right their billion-dollar checks. Oh, yeah. God. Oh, but they're going to say, they're going to say, Robert, it was to prevent severe cases of the disease. No, that's, that's called a diagnostic. And it's specifically in the contract. They weren't, they weren't uh, negotiating a diagnostic. Uh, they weren't a, 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 diagno- a therapeutic. Mm-hmm. There's diagnostic, therapeutic, and preventative. Those are the three things that were listed in the contract as alternatives. They're like, we're not looking for a diagnostic tool. We're not paying you for that. We're not looking for a therapeutic because that's what would be reducing the s- significance of the severity of the illness. They said, we want something that prevents it. That's what we're paying for, prevention, not therapeutics. So that's completely contradicted by the plain language of what they promised in writing. Oh, oh do I have my, my, my next uh, death? No, the, the nail in the coffin rebuttal whenever I have to have that argument again with somebody. Okay, that's phenomenal. Um, st- the, the other government- big vaccine case oh, is the okay. CHD this week in New Orleans. Oh, that's a Children's Health Defense. Uh, I don't, well, first of all, one, the government has not yet stepped in to take the case away from Brooke Jackson and shut it down. No, no. Okay. Uh, what's up with Children's Health Defense? I'm not, I'm not up to speed on that. So this is the case we brought against the Food and Drug Administration in the uh, Western District of Texas, the Waco Division. And the, def- and the FDA's, and what our grounds was that CHD had petitioned the Food and Drug Administration to not authorize and label the COVID-19 vaccine and its boosters as safe and effective for children, because it wasn't, based on the available medical information. The FDA, uh, in some cases, partially responded or simply didn't respond at all. Then it did the authorization, knowing all the downstream consequences that flow from that authorization, including that the FD, that the Children's Health Defense would have to divert almost all of its res- resources for all of its activities for its members and the public and shift it to dealing with this issue primarily above all. It led to budget deficits 
throughout the rest of what Children's Health Defense was doing because of how uh, uh, overwhelming this issue was and its impact on children and the rights of parents to control what goes into their children's bodies and getting accuracy of information from the Food and Drug Administration. The claim that we brought was that they had violated the right to petition process in the Administrative Procedures Act and how they'd handled the FDA and the F- how the FDA had handled CHD's petition. They had also targeted Children's Health Defense to maintain, because what the what is the FDA fundamentally? It's a branding, marketing, and labeling agency. Like they, there was an allegation, they froze a bunch of Amos Miller's food saying maybe, maybe it's misbranded. How? How is it misbranded? They don't identify any grounds for claiming it. What's misbranded is what the FDA did with this COVID vaccine for kids. It's what they did for everybody, but it's even more egregious as to kids. This was not safe for kids. This was not effective for kids. It didn't uh, prevent COVID-19 for kids. Uh, and it was more harmful than helpful by a long degree. So brought suit saying this authorization shouldn't have been issued, that the petitioning process should have been recognized and honored, that the labeling and branding that they're putting out there is false and misleading to people, and that the downstream consequences of this, and in addition, when the Children's Health Defense tried to get the truth out there, the FDA, as the Biden versus Missouri case detailed, deliberately targeted Children's Health Defense to prevent Children's Health Defense from communicating the truth about the dangers of the COVID-19 vaccine for little kids. They authorized it all the way down to six months old. And, and, and we sued on behalf of parents. We sued on behalf of members. We sued on behalf of the organization. And we sued on behalf of foster kids who are going to be mass injected in Texas, in orphanages and other locations, given how it was set up. So uh, we brought suit because parents, their relationship with their child was being invaded by the state's misrepresentation and misinformation about the COVID-19 vaccine. It was creating, and has been documented in the D.C. case, a, a, an atmosphere of coercion on children in all kinds of settings because the caregivers, the doctors, the professionals had been told by the FDA false information about the vaccine that was then interfering with and impairing the parent's relationship with the child, its own cognizable in- injury, while also impacting the psychology of the kid, a separate independent injury. And of course, there's all the economic drain on the uh, children's health defense from having to divert resources massively to this. So to me, that fit Article Three's definition of a case for controversy, because that's all the Article Three says. It says federal courts have jurisdictions over case or, not and, or controversy. That should be a case or controversy. The district court said no. The district court treated our complaint as if we were just whining in general about a government policy out of the blue. It's like, that's not what's happening here. In fact, at the pleading stage of the case, all of our facts have to be presumed true. All inferences have to be reasonably presumed. Any reasonable inference has to be presumed true on our side. Instead, the judge did just the opposite. I think the clerk probably wrote the opinion. All of the, de- the defendant's arguments were taken as true. As an example, they said, well, you didn't allege that this will lead to people not buying uh, or using vaccines. Actually, we did. They, they, they just dis- disagreed with us about whether it would lead to that. Now we all know the level at which, because one of the allegations is this misinformation is going to lead to other injury beyond the COVID vaccine, which is that vaccines that might be good for people, people are no longer going to take because they no longer know what's safe and what's not. And in fact, we know that the rate of vaccine declination has has more than tripled in the United States since the COVID-19 vaccine debacle. And we, by the way, we allege that was going to be the case in the complaint, which the judge just ignored. Didn't talk about 12B6 standard, didn't talk about pleading standard, didn't talk about reasonable inferences, didn't talk about presuming all facts are true. He just presumed all the defense allegations were true, which was its own violation. But so our argument is this is a case of controversy. There have been downstream consequences from this violation of the Administrative Procedures Act, from this misinformation and mislabeling that the FDA has given to the world about the safety and efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine for little children. And so the question for the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals is, did we state in the pleadings, assuming all facts are true and all inferences in our favor, a case or controversy under Article 3? If this isn't a case or controversy under Article 3, then what is? The, I mean, the, the aside from my longstanding objection to the misapplication of the standing doctrine, the word standing ain't in the Constitution, and a lot of these originalists seem to keep forgetting that, uh, the, the plain text just says case or controversy, but even under the existing rules, 
misinformation of this kind that has these downstream consequences causing direct economic, psychological, and relational harm on individuals and organizations has always been recognized as grounds for standing, and there should be no exception just because it's the COVID-19 vaccine or the FDA. What the FDA is claiming is nobody can ever sue them that other than the drug companies themselves, that even if they completely violate the Constitution, even if they completely violate what Congress restricted them from doing, even if they violated their own rules and restrictions, even if they violated Congress's limitations to the Administrative Procedures Act, enforcing the right to petition of the First Amendment, no court can review them. Nobody can sue them unless it's the drug company themselves. And that has never been the law, nor can it be if we're going to have a constitutional democracy or constitutional republic. Robert, before I ask you the question as to whether or not you've read this new study that alleges 17,000 people were killed by HCQ, um, I know you got something with Tyson Foods. Yeah, that's the, we got a bunch of cases. So uh, credit to one of our great board members, Little Rock Attorney, uh, stepping into the gap because the in the, the federal case we filed against Tyson Foods in Arkansas, because it was the only venue, unfortunately, you know, the... I had skepticism about the impartiality of the Arkansas judiciary uh, when it comes to Tyson Foods. But and that was, in my view, vindicated by what I've seen and witnessed so far. We filed suit in federal court. The federal judge dismissed them and then threatened to sanction me for talking about the Nuremberg Code. And uh, that we are taking up to the appeal in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. But we also brought a claim under Arkansas state law that was supposed to prohibit vaccine mandates and discrimination based on it for employees. And the judge uh, dismissed that without prejudice and said, you can go file that in state court if you want. So that's what we did. We went and filed in state court, but we were up against the clock because it was a pretty short clock to be able to preserve certain arguments about the statute of limitations in Arkansas. Probably not applicable in any instance, but we just wanted to preserve it just in case. And uh, the, the, a bunch of lawyers who had previously told me they're happy to be local counsel in Arkansas suddenly weren't available. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, you know, that's, it's amazing. You know, you'll get some big talkers now and then. And uh, then when the, you know, maybe it was holidays and people were gone. So I'll excuse that as a possibility. But I had been told early on by other Arkansas lawyers that who had previously said, Hey, I'll, I'd be happy to work with you on some of these cases. When I said I wanted to sue Tyson Foods in Fayetteville, they were like, uh, let me get back to you on that. And some others were like, are you crazy? Do you understand how Tyson Foods wins all the time in Fayetteville? Uh, I'm like, well, that's the only place we can sue. So, but Little Rock Attorney stepped right into the gap, uh, made sure we got everything filed. He's our local counsel now against Tyson Foods on that state law claim in state law court, in state court there in uh, in in uh, Arkansas. That's amazing. And then we got a bunch of other cases. We have cases. We have multiple cases in Tennessee, cases in Pennsylvania, cases in Oklahoma, case in Missouri, case in Kentucky. Uh, so in Tyson Foods all across the country, the latest line of logic from Tyson Foods and 3M, one of the other major companies that we're suing in this capacity. Um, and there'll be a, even some of the Red Hat, IBM, James O'Keefe issues are implicated in one of our cases that derive indirectly from the vaccine mandate issues. Uh, is the, the corporation are throwing everything at us. And some of the judges are asserting that suddenly it's no longer a religious objection. Uh, that they're, they're just going to interpret what is and isn't religious out of the blue. That's that's one line of logic they're pursuing. Another line of logic is to harass the heck out of the plaintiffs. Disclose all of your social media forever. Disclose your entire medical history forever. Uh, judges that would never allow this in other contexts are in this case because they, in my view, want to punish people suing over vaccine mandates. Uh, we have, you know, some courts are saying religious harassment doesn't apply. Only sexual harassment or racial harassment applies. And you can't sue for religious harassment. So we're challenging that. We have over 25 pending vaccine mandate cases in state and federal court across the country on behalf of about 40 different individuals uh, that uh, we'll be pursuing. I actually added people to my legal team to help with those cases because they're reaching the summary judgment stage, the uh, the full discovery stage, the potential trial stage. Try, you know, if we're depending on what a judge determines in Tennessee, we may have a trial uh, upcoming in the big Tennessee case uh, in spring. But I think what I think over the next 2024 will shape the future of vaccine mandate cases, because unfortunately, the Supreme Court decided to go in and vacate all the cases against the Biden administration. So we need to establish that this is wrong, that you so that this will not happen again. To quote the Nuremberg Code, never or the principle of it, never again. 
Uh, so we're going to be pursuing those. I'm going to pursue the Nuremberg claims at the highest possible level because you should. How is it the only people that can enforce the Nuremberg Code are foreigners in foreign jurisdictions? That makes no sense. America invented it. America enforced it on the rest of the world. By golly, it's enforceable against American companies and Americans here on behalf of Americans. Uh, so the we're going to assert those claims as, as far as we can, try to get as much relief or remedy. Same with the ADA-based discrimination claims. A lot of courts don't like condoning here. We're going to continue to push and see if the courts will recognize that that discrimination law also applies under this circumstance. And then, of course, the religious discrimination, various state law claims will continue to pursue. But the uh, whether or not this can ever happen again will be determined in 2024 by the various court adjudications that are going to take place, especially in the Tyson cases, but also in other cases that we have. Well, if it's going to follow the way of Canada, not only is it going to happen again in the future, it's going to happen sooner than later. Robert, have you heard this new study that's claiming that there was an estimated 17,000 deaths caused by a compassionate use of a hydroxychloroquine? No. Okay. I, I, I just posted the link to the, the study to our community, uh, mm -hmm. and I would like the aggregate knowledge to break it down because I got my questions. These were ho allegedly hospitalized patients with COVID uh, administered hydroxychloroquine, and now in a retrospective, they're saying they died from HCQ, not from COVID. Um, okay, we'll, we'll break that down. All right. What else do Last, we have, Last uh, topics briefly are just that uh, crypto is going to be up for big appellate review about whether or not the feds can regulate crypto. Uh, they unsurprisingly shut down the political corruption aspects of the Sam Bankman-Fried cases. We had talked about how they had structured the extradition, so that was pretty much a guarantee. Well, that, that's the thing. It, it was nothing new. Other, it was the extradition argument that they added. They tacked on those charges after the extradition agreement. Well, was. that was half of it. What the other charges they dropped were some that, that were still within the extradition, but would have gone to evidence concerning political corruption. Mm -hmm. And they decided, we don't, we don't really need to go there. No reason to talk about the biggest Biden campaign 2020 Democratic contributor was Sam Bankman-Fried and his family. No, we don't need to go there in an election year. Uh, we cleaned up all that mess. We got that boy locked away, and he ain't talking to nobody anytime soon. He's in the same jail Epstein was in. Good luck with that if he wants to whisper something to somebody the wrong way about what and how he was really up to and on behalf of whom. But their war on crypto will continue. Elizabeth Warren is trying to expand and get into it. The IRS is trying to tax more of it trace it wants to know everybody that's been involved in that 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 uh, dangerous bitcoin world uh and so you're going to see more wars on it they want to classify it as a security even though it really isn't in most instances so they can regulate it restrict it and run it out of town and uh, similarly uh there may be uh george gammon may be bringing suit uh soon against the federal reserve uh based on their wrongful denial of a range of freedom of information act we were requests we made, one of which includes their internal conversations about crypto and crypto regulation, but going back to their conversations all the way back to 1913, uh, various that we have made very specific, including in income tax limitations and the like about what they've really been up to. Uh, we want a real set of books from the Fed. So in order to audit the Fed, you probably got to sue the Fed. We've now established most of the factual record we need for the FOIA case to reach trial litigation. I don't know how eager George Gammon is to be George Gammon versus the Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, we'll find out when we uh, run into him down there in Maine. Uh, I mean, May in Orlando uh, when he wants to go bowling with you uh, since he got his bowling instruction <laughs> video from you. Uh, but uh, but that's that those are the other financial freedom cases of great impact and import for 2024. Uh, someone in the chat on Rumble says Viva. Uh, let me see here. Where was it? Some Canadian children inhaled fibers from masks. Any lawsuit for them from InfoWarrior 4? Not that I know of, because I don't know that there's been any uh, damage or injury attributed to that, but that was back in, say, the early days of COVID, when allegedly there were potentially toxic face masks that had been mandated at various daycares for students and teachers. People were complaining. It felt like they had cat hairs in their throat, and it turns out they contained a very small particle. I think it was, um, I want to say graphene, but I might be mistaken. And uh, all of those masks were recalled and people are now going to live in terror as to whether or not they basically inhaled their current version of asbestos through those, through those face masks. Um, we're going to go over to vivabarnslaw.locals.com for the after party. Shofar on Rumble with the rant says, as I said, no faith in the courts anymore. And Andres Decano says, are there existing hush hushes on the Rockefellers? Robert, I don't know about that. Not yet. No, I don't think so. I think I've done the big ones I'm going to do. Them with. Now, there is, if you want a good description on Rockefeller, uh, the Colbert 
uh, or no, it was Colbert. Uh, no, I'm getting his last name wrong. The report. Somebody in the chat will uh, remember. Col- Colbert. Colbert. Yeah, that's right. It is Colbert. Yeah. Colbert. Right. Yeah. Uh, Colbert I, I'm report. just. It's throwing me off who, because it's the same last name as the other dude. The guy who's no longer funny. No, no, not him. This is a different guy. <laughs> it's uh, it's Col- on yeah, the Col- whatever Colbert. reason. Greg does great reports. Uh, you can just you know look up Big Oil documentary Rockefeller, and it'll come up on YouTube or Rumble. And that that's a very good introduction as well. Okay, excellent. I'm giving everybody the link in uh, the Rumble chat. And by the way, just so everybody knows, this is not the new time for the show, period. It will always go back to 6 o'clock. I'm just going to the Dolphins versus the New York Bills? Oh, Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills. The Corbett oh, Report. Ah. Corbett Report. That's the title of it. Yeah, the same Corbett. Okay. Oh, Corbett wait, well, Report. I, I knew I was saying Corbett. That can't maybe be right. Uh, Corbett Report. He has a lot of great independent research. Did a great combination on big tech. He also, if you uh, on big oil, also did a great one on Bill Gates. So if you want to look up his his four part documentary on big oil, look at his four part documentary on Bill Gates. Uh, you'll be well served. Uh, he did, he did a very good job at both of those. Well, hold on, this is I'm, uh, dude. I, I sent this to our locals community. Listen to this: deaths induced by com- induced by compassionate use of hydroxychloroquine during the first COVID nineteen wave. An estimate. And I think, let's see, if we go down to section 2.2.1, we conducted a systematic review of meta-analysis of cohort studies to estimate the mortality rates and the proportion of HCQ exposure in hospital patients in each country represented in the studies. I'm going to have to go see how they did this study. My prediction, it's going to be a steaming load of bullcrap. Uh, but they're going to they're go back and reclassify what they had prior already classified as COVID deaths to HCQ deaths. That's my prediction. Okay, uh, what we are doing right now, people... We are ending on a rumble. Come on over to vivabarnslaw.locals.com. Vivabarnslaw.locals.com. Here's the link. And uh, we're going to do the after party there. We have four stories. We're going to do the chat, the tips. And then I'm going to go see an American football game for the first time in my entire life. We're going to see how that works. Okay. Ending on rumble right now. Everybody, happy new year. Um, And come on over for the white pill. Barnes will give us a white pill because I I know that Barnes has got one. Ending on rumble Three, two, one, peace. Okay, now I don't want to cough again. I feel like I might have to cough again, but okay, Robert, I'll get to the tips. I'm going to see if I'm going to scroll up, load more messages, scroll, scroll, scroll. Okay, we got Cindy Ones, $10, says, want to help Amos Miller can help with marketing as well as raising funds within the real estate world. Connected and for this one uh, of the biggest property rights issues, people have been very naive, like in Texas over HOAs. I've been walking... Capitol Hill here in Texas and D.C. FBI was not in D.C. on 1-6. Uh, bro- brokers and agents around the country need to get behind this. Cindy Stewart, that's C-I-N-D-I-E Stewart at gmail.com. I truly want to take this one up the hill. I own my little farm too. Bill Brown says, I will admit, if you were going to do a Dolphins game, this is the one you want to go to. Take Ethan. You'll love it. Big game for both teams. I believe it's called a wild card game. I no, what it is, uh, whoever wins is the conference champion and gets to play at home next week in the playoffs. <laughs> Maybe just... even gets to play at home twice in the playoffs. Whoever loses probably has to go on the road in the playoffs. Uh, the I, Bills are already in because the Jacksonville Jaguars lost earlier today. People are listening to me talk with the same Viva. You have, you don't deserve to go to this game. Unfortunately, dessert has not everything to do with life, and uh, I, I, I'm still going. Uh, okay, so hold on. Where was I? I was in the chat here. Uh, Denise Antu says, I'm going to have to cut out when the Cowboys game starts. I'll finish after we play. Uh, then we got Bill Brown. I can't look at myself with a mirror, David. I can't look at myself without a mirror, David. Okay. <laughs> we got, Can people go up to Amos Miller's farm and still buy his products? Ithaca 37 Cato. Still yes. open for business except for what has been placed under seizure. Correct. Cat Zap ten dollars says, "Can Trump sue all these people and entities for slander and defamation by claiming he incited an insurrection when it was proven there was no such thing?" Ah, no, because according to the Colorado court and the lower decision, the lower judge, there was an insurrection. Except the lower court said Article fourteen doesn't apply to him. The Colorado Supreme Court said, "No, it does. You're wrong. You're wrong." Um, Bill Brown says, "Remember when the lion scar, when Scar cheated to win as king." And the pride land was overrun with hyenas and all the lions lost everything they had built and just and maintained, just asking no reason. I'm going to have to go watch that again. Uh, spam, spam right. This is a $1 I'll read. Anyway. Tit for tat. Game theory is how to manage psychopaths. I've worked alongside many psychopaths in engineering. Tit for tat is the strategy that works best against them. Psychopaths are dangerous to the system because they wreck things on purpose. SAC 808. SEC 808. I'm sorry. SEC. 
What about the independent counsel non-investing by non-investigating Biden's classified documents issue? Is he a properly approved investigator, congressionally approved? What about the independent counsel? Robert, who's who's Oh yeah, so the it depends. I don't know. I assume that person is appointed depends on how they appoint him and what power they give him. What was unique about Jack Smith is they gave him all the power of, of the attorney general himself without him even being a US attorney. So the it, it, a lot of the independent counsels haven't always been given that degree of power. The one or if they have, they were someone who wasn't a US attorney. Remember the one that was doing that was supposed to be getting into Russia gate, John Durham. He was the United States attorney. So that's how the what is is they changed the law so that you, any US attorney appointed anywhere can act any in any other jurisdiction. I think there's more limitations to that than the government thinks, but that's another side. The difference here is Jack Smith's not even a U.S. attorney. Okay. They, they took him off the street and said, yeah, pro- we'll get pri- Trump for us. According to Mises Amicus, private citizen Jack Smith. I mean, they, his name is Jack Smith. It was, go get uh, Trump for us, or we're going to put out the factor on the Epstein files like uh, Jimmy Kimmel. It, so hold on. Okay. What happened? Aaron Rodgers wrongly suggested. Was it a joke or is he? He was partially joking. But what is his Jimmy Kimmel's? I believe it's Jimmy Kimmel's chef was Epstein's chef uh. and his personal friends with him. So I think and Kimmel has gone after Rodgers on other stuff related to the vaccine stuff. So that's why Rodgers was having some fun. Uh, the uh, well, saying, I wonder if Jimmy Kimmel's on the Epstein. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. Me thinks Jimmy Kimmel doth protest too much uh, because sure he, that 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 uh, only a stuck pig squeals and he was sure just, was squealing. I was just about to say it, Robert. Uh, Debbie underscore oh five dollars says two questions on behalf of Elliot. One of two. If no official acts of immunity, what stops Missouri indictment of Biden, Secretary of Education Agreed. Agreed. for conspiracy to defraud? I mean, be all bets are off. I mean, reality is if they say no presidential immunity. Prosecutors should go and indict Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama. Start indicting them all. So yeah. Joe Biden. Just start indicting them all. Uh, I mean, that's what will happen. And th- that's why I think the Supreme Court's going to step in and realize, okay, this this is unmanageable. We can't really let this go this far. Even these this Sorry. coward coward riddled Supreme Court. And then the next part of that question was next administration charging federal conspiracy, calling this loan relief plan an attempted $430 billion scheme to defraud. Aside from Mises' overarching argument, have you looked into whether Smith ever took the oath in 2022? Yeah, I think we got that one. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's been an issue that whether he's actually even gone through the proper formalities. We got Victor Same underscore- issue, by the way, in Pennsylvania. It turns out the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture officials, they may not have taken the proper oath. Which wouldn't surprise me. They skip that stuff all the time because they don't care anymore. And nobody does anything about it. Victor Cardone says, uh, if SCOTUS makes the proper ruling regarding Trump, how will the radical left attack him next? Forget attack him. How are they going to go after the judges next? I mean, they're going to they're going to want to pack that or expand that court yeah. uh, you know, up the wazoo. I am curious what their backup plan is, because I don't think they planned for this. And I don't know if they have one. But you see even Bill Barr. See, I've always explained Bill Barr is a deep state guy, but he's like a Henry Kissinger style deep state guy. He knows the limits. He not only has now come out and said, don't take Trump off the ballot. He said, by, he said what we talked about all the way back to the beginning of January 6th. We said, if, if the only people they go after are the real violent people, there's not going to be a lot of political support for them. If they start going after grandmas who wandered in, it's going to lead to massive political backlash. That's what's happened. No. Another, just... And was Bill Barr say this week? You know, we all went way too far in the January 6th cases. Because right? what he's annoyed at is he's like, if you guys would have just targeted the violent people, we would have a perfect narrative. And you're totally screwing up the narrative because you're trying to put grandma in prison. So that's the, the only difference between Bill Barr and the other deep state corrupt hacks. He's a smart, Remember Bill he's Barr's a dad? Smart. He uh, hired uh, Epstein. There's a little connection between them. We wrote a little book, book, Bill Barr's dad, about, you know, uh, little kids and wrong activities. The, uh, uh, but, the, but he's, yes, he's, as you point out, he's smart. He understands the limits. That's why I think the system is starting to realize, oh, we push too far here. The smarter actors, we push too far here. So I don't know how far they'll go. Maybe they'll roll the dice and hope that the election comes out their way. Maybe they'll try to steal it again. I'm sure they'll try to steal it again. The question is how much they can get away with trying to steal it again. Well, they're, try- they're trying to steal it right now. It's, it's What yeah. they're doing right now is election interference, period, full stop. The, I mean, the big scary thing is do they escalate to assassination? But again, you're going to have to assassinate both Trump and Kennedy. Well, the, I, I, uh, I don't, I don't know. the deep state. I get some people don't like Robert Kennedy for a range of reasons. The deep state is terrified of Robert Kennedy. But Robert, so the, and, and it, uh, it, they, they would have to take both out. And are you really going to take out another Kennedy? Really? 
I mean, at that level, I mean, the, the confidence could just collapse in the country. And that's the fifth pillar of power that holds up the other four pillars of power. So I'm hoping we have enough rational actors inside the deep state apparatus to let this play out, take an L, manage it accordingly, don't go crazy and kill the whole country. I don't know. I think they. Uh, part of me thinks they'd rather rule over the ashes than uh, than cede power because there's, they are. There's, there, there's elements of that, but there's elements like Bill Barr. That's like, yeah, we'll maneuver it this way. We'll maneuver it this way. Um, and I like to think, God forbid, whatever. There's there's Vivek Ramaswamy as the alternative, but if if shit hits the fan with the GOP, how was Vivek in the interview? I, I, love, saw, I, I, I saw parts of it. Oh, don't worry, he I, seemed look, pretty chill. I I like Vivek. I started skeptical, and I and I and I gave him a hard time. It's not because his first name, his name six or sounds like Viva. Look at Viva and Vivek has a ring to it, a rhyme to it, but no, it's because the the dude he, he look he's slick. He might come off as a little too polished, a little too art not artificial, but but you know rehearsed. Get over it. Right. His answers are on point. And if anybody thinks he's a uh, deep he state. He seems very sincere. The fact he's willing Absolutely. to do. Well, I, I agree with Patrick Bet David. By the way, you know how rich that guy is? That guy's yeah, like he, rolling around the dough. Three, Come on, Pat. Uh, you, you, you should invite us, Patrick. You're, you're, you're too rich <laughs> not to invite us. Three, the, uh, I, I, was, I looked it up because but people don't understand that. The man is wildly successful. He's worth and, close to half a billion. Yeah, no, no, and I, and I, what I like about what I, I don't care about wealth like that, except it makes you independent, free thinking, yeah. and you can say what you want. So, and he clearly does. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, he, the, what he said. Now he nailed DeSantis. He was like, you know what? He goes, I was around DeSantis, and I was around him. I was like, he's that kid who walked on eggshells his whole life, and, and with the eager plant, with the you know the little uh, you know Reese Witherspoon elections movie uh, kind of plan to be president, and that it's always limited him. Uh, the uh, but that that was very insightful. But the uh, but you know, and he had pointed out uh, uh, some positive things about uh, Vivek as well. And one of the things he pointed out was you can know somebody's sincerity and authenticity if they're willing to sit down and talk to anybody, particularly Absolutely. podcasters. Sit down. Trump for- is Kennedy is Vivek is. Yeah. No, no. I mean, and DeSantis did on PBD, but didn't didn't fare well for it. And he probably learned a very important. They lesson. generally limited how much of those he did. Um, yeah, no, but first of all, I, I like Patrick Pat David, but I like Vivek and, and, and it's like, you ask him that he's, he's, he's thought things through and you may yep. disagree with his answers, but he's and not. I think he's, he's also been willing to change his mind, which mm-hmm. I, one of the things I love best about Kennedy, uh, also love the best about Vivek is a willing to change his mind. I mean, he's reversed his position on a range of issues as he digs in and I like his policy ideas. So I don't have full trust in him because of his past. Uh, but you know, the corporate bio, you know, bio sector ties, but he's contributing to the debate in a very positive way about how to take out the administrative state, how to take on the deep state, how to deal with these war whores, uh, really calling out ne- neocon uh, uh, war Karen, Nikki Haley. Uh, so all of that is fun to watch. Do you, do, I mean, Patrick Bet David's net worth, for whatever it's worth on the internet, says about $350 million. Vivek is worth a billion. Nine hundred and fifty million, even according hey, to Forbes. Hey, Vivek, uh, yeah, you cool. should advertise. No, but it's it's amazing. It gives you the freedom. It's the it's, yeah, it's the exactly literal what it fu it's money. What, I, it's what it was for Trump. That's why Trump didn't care if he went down to a hundred million. There's part of his pride, competitive pride, that would. The the but it was more about independent. It's what it was for Alex Jones. A little secret about Alex Jones. He wasn't acquiring that money so he could sit on some mountain someplace. What he was all all the wealth he has acquired his entire life was dedicated to staying on the air and voicing his own opinion. Uh, that's why he had no corporate advertisers for the last 20 years or so. Um, and obviously him being back alive on Twitter and the rest is, is looking good. Yeah. The uh, boosting him. Uh, we may be on Thursday, a special edition, Alex Jones live with uh, Vivan Barnes. Booyah. Um, uh, amazing. Okay. We got Pete to base. 10 bucks says, if the Supreme Court rules moving that removing Trump off the ballot is against the U.S. Constitution, what happens, <laughs> excuse me, if the states tell the court, you made the ruling now enforce it, e.g. Andrew Johnson. What mm. opinions are open? What options are open to the Supreme Court to enforce their ruling? The U.S. Marshals. Okay, we got Andy D. How about a sidebar with the Amish community? Robert, do they do... I don't mean this in any joking no, way. Do they, they do will interviews? not appear on radio. They will not appear on phone. They, they believe bringing attention to themselves is a sin, for the most part. So okay. they, they don't... They, that's why there's no photographs. They don't make appearances. They don't make statements. And, and they, I presume they don't take kindly to jackasses like me who would run around the community with a phone and like making sure. Oh yeah, they, they don't. They don't want you filming anything. Okay. Uh, any of that. So if I if I if I visit, it's gonna have to be cold turkey. Um, no no social media or no tech tech for me. Tim underscore good. 
How are Amos funding sites distributed towards the various activities? So the two different things, Free America Law Center pays for the legal fees and cost. You know, the, we're going to need to hire independent, uh, well-regarded, well-respected samplers to rebut any false claims they make about his food products, uh, as well as all the you know local council costs, filing fees, costs, admin, those things, as well as legal fees. Uh, and then uh, other costs. I, I'm going to have to get up there and be there for about a week in Philly coming up, not this coming week, but next week uh, to, to figure out what's going on, on the ground. The thing with the Amish is, you know, the, the, like, they'll talk by land phone now and then, but otherwise they do everything in person. So I, got, I need to be up there in person to figure out, OK, what's our next step? How can we do this? How can we do that? You know, do we file something in court? Do we do an emergency injunction? Can I get somebody that can be a plaintiff other than uh, Amos? I need to talk to the Amish community and say, Time to rally, um, you know, hope hope they start to hear. I mean, I fear that they'll just be wiped out before they realize what's happening. Um, that's the system's goal. The uh, And so, uh, 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 but so that Free America Law Center goes to pay for all that. The, because he, Amos doesn't have the funds for that. He hasn't for the last year and a half, um, you know, the, uh, in terms of the kind of legal expense that's required. Uh, he contributes what he can, but that's a very small amount of the actual time we we spend on investing his case. Uh, and the goal of Free America Law Center is just to reduce my out of pocket cost. To be frank, uh, it's not going to compensate the time, uh, but his case is too important to do otherwise. The uh, and then the Lancaster Patriot fundraiser that's to put money in Amos's pocket to cover all the losses he will have over the next sixty days. Okay. I'm going to read through these fast because I got to start hitting the road here. Pasha Moyer says, Robert, besides supporting Amos, we should encourage people to consider using local sources for direct from the farm oh, food. absolutely. Here in the absolutely. Twin Cities, my family has long been using a farmer that is on Farm Match, and we love it. Yeah, uh, Farm Match is really good. I'm actually going to open that up and keep that in the backdrop for myself. We got Red Sox fan 777 says, have fun of the game tonight. Thank you very much. We'll do Gray 101. How will Trump return USA prices back down to pre-COVID levels? American families need it. Uh, Bender is great. What's the deal with Trump's election fraud report? I haven't heard anyone say anything about it. Is this a good or a bad sign? Robert, what's the election? I thought it was a solid for? report, uh, but there were so many other factors in the news this past week that that's, I think, why Trump world didn't pay tons of attention. The second reason is Trump world is very familiar with all that. So Trump is mostly getting it out there so people have am you know, ar ammo in their argument um, about it. The uh, because there was it, it was Trump was responding to the mainstream media, which Meet the Press was reporting the same nonsense with their interview with Elise Stefanik today, uh, saying, "Oh, this has all been rebutted by all the courts." It's like well, that's completely false by anybody who remembered it. So I think he's also re responding to that. But uh, also, I think just the timing uh, was. But he the timing wasn't critical. The point was for him to get that information out there, so it's a source people can go to to cite. Uh, when somebody says 2020 was the cleanest election in history. Well, then why didn't this is my same response? Didn't somebody ask that? Well, why wouldn't they allow any signature match checks on all those mail-in ballots then? I, I was I was trying to fact check that one again today in Georgia. They said they didn't they didn't do a signature verification the third time because they had already done two prior signature verifications. They had done none. They, I mean, there was no independent party observed signature verification ever in the state of Georgia. Period. Done. Uh, Robert, I want to thank you for your appearance on America's Untold Stories. We had the best sales from sponsoring so far. Moon Dose. Oh, Moon Does Art. Hold on, it's that Moon is? Dose that's opposite of Starbucks. And so it's art? like Dose like the is what Eric Hunley explained. Okay, Moon That's probably Dose. Hunley. No, this is from Moon Dose. It says Moon Dose Artisan oh, Coffee. Oh, yes, that's sir. cool. I'm an idiot. I can't read this properly here. It's Moon Dose, M O O N. Like deer. D like Dose is deer. All right. I was thinking, oh, Moon Dose. Like Female Moon Dose. Artisancoffee.com. Moon Dose Artisancoffee.com. Gray 101, how will Trump stop or even reverse the momentum of offshoring American jobs? The same way he did it the first time. It's, I don't know, easy, easy enough by way of policy. Thank you for fighting for the common people. We need more like you. That's from Mandalici. David, I took hydroxychloroquine for a number of years for an autoimmune disease. The only thing I had to be monitored for was a change in my eyes and only because they used to give me a much higher doses and it can make you go blind. Since the dose issues were worked out over 50 years ago. No, it's, it's so stupid. Like the, hydroxychloroquine has been a miracle drug forever. Uh, you know, the, the miracle drug that they've been prescribing to billions of people and only now has there been a spike in purported deaths from it. Bullcrap. They were administering it to people who are already on death's door 
and uh, now they're going to go, you know, reverse the codes on their death certificate and say, no, this is no longer a COVID death because they all died with COVID because they had COVID. Now it's a hydroxychloroquine death. It's, it's, it's bullshit and I can smell it right now. Uh, Raider Nation says, would it help Pennsylvania constables help protect? Would it help if P- Pennsylvania constables help protect Amos Miller from invalid persecution? I mean, I mean, I'm not going to rag on the Lancaster sheriffs because they had the local Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and a court signed search warrant telling them to do it. But I think they would benefit from a little more education about what is a prima facie valid warrant and isn't. Because when they're there to help execute that warrant, uh, they can be individually sued for allowing things to go on that were wrong. So, you know, the uh, uh, I would hope that they would wink, use wink. it as a learning opportunity. And they, they should have known you can never trust the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Hold on, I'm going to cough here. Excuse me, it's not terrible, people. It's a little tickle in my throat. Okay, and then we got two more here. Robert is breathing fire of liberty tonight. His brilliance and passion to preserve our freedoms is inspiring and appreciated. That's from Until is Empty. And then we got Ken, Ken, 1979. By the way, Robert, I finally saw Barbie. The movie wasn't controversial. It was just boring and stupid and had no coherent plot. Uh, Is there an alternative narrative on Arthur Anderson? The official narrative was, yeah, SCOTUS overturned the convictions, but there's still corrupt possible hush-hush. They were smart, and they realized that uh, it was time for nothing to be in writing by shredding it all. <laughs> and then we got all good guys. Says for the record, and regarding my novel theory, I am not suicidal. I have thoughts. I have no thoughts of hurting myself or others. That's from all good guy. And then we got Eric F sent to five dollars. Says just donated to five hundred bucks to Free America Law Center. Please don't spam me. We, we, we don't. Uh, I send out very few emails to anybody who subscribes to the Free America Law Center. Only when there's some real big update or something else. Uh, the uh, I, I limit it for that reason. Okay, now do we blitz through the remaining four short stories? There's, there's, uh, Cher is trying to get a conservatorship over her drug addicted son, apparently, because she's afraid. Well, he's gonna... It shows the danger. That the reason why I highlighted, other than you know, celebrity in the news, but it's celebrity in the news that can tell us something about the court system. Britney Spears' case should have educated people how dangerous conservatorships are. And what Cher was trying to do, I thought was dangerous. She was saying, I don't like my child's lifestyle. So you judge, let me have complete control over my adult over, oh, child's Over the lifestyle. money that was coming from, who does she, the Allman. Is that the Allman brothers, Allman guy? Maybe. Her, her, it's her first husband and this the kid gets royalties from the Oh brothers. no, no, it's not that guy, it's a different guy. Okay, well he's, so the, Cher is nervous that her, her, her adult son who's getting back together with his wife and doesn't sound like Cher likes his wife. Is, is this gonna, the one that's still a son that's a wife that used to be a woman that's now in Maine or something? Uh, I don't think so. No, no, no. I think this is well, one of Cher's kids changed genders. Set, well, okay. I don't, I don't know who this was, but this guy's married to a woman. They split up. Now they seem to be getting back together. It doesn't sound like Cher likes the, 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 the daughter-in-law. Anyhow, so the court said, uh, we're dismissing your request only because it's missing some technicalities in terms of having been served Which, on your son. To me, I found it. It's like, I was like, okay, this is not what conservatorships are for. Conservatorships are for people who truly cannot function anymore. And you liberalize that standard. And courts all of a sudden are grabbing control over your life, like what happened to Britney Spears. So I, I, I found it very disturbing that Cher was even seeking that. And it's something to keep our eye on because it's a very dangerous judicial power of mis- oh, misuse. God, this, this is I, this, it's, it's what I used to do in the first three years of my legal career was, uh, you know, motions for confinement and things like this, where you just pay, basically take people's lives away from them uh, under yeah. the, pre- the fear that they would hurt themselves or others. Of course. Okay, the uh, paralegals... They never seem to care about the poor people doing that, though, do they? Uh, it's always the ones that got some resources. <laughs> oh, we need to help conserve your accounts for you. The, uh, uh, But yeah, the other two are bonus paralegals, free speech right. The other should include are... the right to give legal advice. Well, I'm all for their lawsuit. I think it'll be uphill, but I'm all for it. Well, they're, they're basically saying there's certain acts that are reserved to lawyers, certified registered lawyers. Paralegals can't give this legal advice, even though it might be helpful to some people. They basically say... We at least want to be able to give like very easy, basic legal advice instead of leaving people high and dry. Poor people who are too rich for legal aid, but too poor for an actual lawyer. Uh, you know, and we could serve them. You were right. It was, this kid is Greg Allman's kid. Oh, is it? Okay. I, I mean, I just saw the name Allman. Man, I saw music. I'm never going to see the Allman band the same way anymore. <laughs> they, uh, uh, you were dumb enough to impregnate Cher? Shudder. <laughs> Shudder. Um, oh, this is another. It's a licensor thing, Robert, where you don't like the fact that, you know. Oh, um, yeah. And And I think anybody should be able to give legal advice. What's interesting is the idea that legal advice could be First Amendment protected. That has all kinds of ramifications. So it'll be an interesting suit to follow. Credit to the paralegals for at least trying to fight the good fight. I predict a failure. That the First Amendment right. Yeah, other courts. 
going to say that the law that the that the paralegals have the authority of the lawyers. No, you know, I mean, a paralegal in this book. You know how they protected the court system and the colonial French system? They banned all lawyers from coming to the colony. No, they're, they're going to say a paralegal giving legal advice without certification is like screaming fire in a, in, a, in a crowded theater. It's not protected speech. Oh, I just shut down. Damn. There was one more. There was one more. Uh, oh, there was one more $5 tip that I, that I, now I just shut down the screen. Um, no, the last bonus topic is Biden is suing Governor Abbott to prevent him from enforcing immigration law under the, these prior dubious cases from the Obama era that said the feds have carte blanche and complete preemption. We'll see how that gets adjudicated throughout the Fifth Circuit. What's, what's amazing is, is New York City of New York is suing bus companies for all, simply allowing the uh, illegal immigrants to be paid to, to go from Texas to New York. No, I, I, I love it that the federal government is suing Texas to say you can't make a state law that, that allows you to exclude, you know, be, Exclude people who are legally present. Be poor. And they say that's, that's, that's definition our, trespassing. Yeah, no, that, that's our authority of the federal government. And we're not exercising it. So piss off Texas to take them. Well, it's at the nuts. same time, supporting implicitly the city of New York, claiming that they can determine who can come into their jurisdiction, mm -hmm. though, by suing the bus company for simply allowing passengers on the bus. Uh, it was curious, George, the last one here. It says in Project 25, in Project 2025, the 2025 Presidential Transition Project Talent Database from the Heritage Foundation, is it legit? How does one submit his resume to be considered by the Trump transition team? From Curious George 83. Uh, the transition team was terrible in 20, 2016. So, I mean, I hope he has a better staffing than, you know, but good luck with that. That's all I have to say, unfortunately. There's some people around Trump I really like. There's some people around Trump, like Jason Miller, who I think is a complete idiot. And so, I mean, I've said, I mean, this guy... It's one thing to cheat on your wife and, and, and knock up somebody. Okay, I mean, that, that's pretty bad values, pretty bad morals. But when you're stupid enough to go to a strip club with her during the campaign, during a debate, you're too dumb. You're too dumb. As I said, don't mind criminals, don't mind dumb people. Combine them and we got a problem. And Jason Miller's one of the key people still around Trump. It's like, good Lord. By the way, he's a Steve Bannon indirect reference. Steve's really got to get a little bit better with his affiliations and associations. God bless his soul. All right. With that said, Robert... I'm going to my first football game. Mm. All right, enjoy it. Everybody and, uh, out there? I, I got a little money. Uh, just need the Dolphins to keep it close. By a close. So they have to win or do they have to not lose no, by a No, they just have to margin? not lose by four or more. Okay, I'm not putting any money on this game because I, 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 I'm a jinx. So I'm just going to go watch and hope for the Bills. Jinx, jinx, win, quick. Okay, ending the stream. Robert, stick around. We'll say our proper goodbyes. Everyone out there, see you tomorrow. Enjoy the week.